that there may well be an issue around the enforceability of our speed limits. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13196, in the name of Maureen Watt, on allied health professionals enabling active and independent living. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And can I say to members at the outset uh, that we do have a generous time allocation for this debate, uh, so the uh, presiding officers will be sympathetic to anybody who wishes to make interventions, and we will ensure that you get your time in lieu for any interventions that you do take. So, can I call on Maureen Watt to speak to and move the motion? Minister, 14 minutes or thereabouts. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and I'm delighted to be opening this debate on the vital role played by allied health professionals, or AHPs as they're known, on their contribution to the health service, enabling active and independent living, and their contribution to the overall improved health and social well-being of the people of Scotland. AHPs are a diverse group of professionals. They can be art therapists, diagnostic and therapeutic radiographers, dietitians, occupational therapists, orthoptists, paramedics, physiotherapists, podiatrists, prosthetists and ortho orthotists and speech and language therapists. <laughs> As the motion states, it is key that this parliament recognises the importance of prevention, early intervention and enablement in supporting the health and social well-being of the population throughout their lifetime. The key role that AHP rehabilitation and enablement services play in supporting individuals to live productive and meaningful lives and the centrality of this approach in underpinning and strengthening the integration of health and social care services. <clears throat> and I'd like to start by emphasising how, just how key the AHP approach to enabling is in this government's ambition of improving the health and well-being of the population of Scotland. And my belief that rehabilitation and enablement will be instrumental in achieving many of the key national outcomes agreed jointly by NHS Scotland and local authorities across Scotland. As we all know, Scotland has a growing elderly population, which is testimony to the many successes in our public health, social care and NHS systems. Whilst the fact that most people are living longer is to be celebrated, the way what, that we must now go about supporting people to maintain their health, their abilities and their social support networks will be vital in not only supporting individuals to live full, active and meaningful lives, but also in sustaining our health and social care services for the future. This is critically important when we consider the demographic and financial pressures already being experienced across the Western world. And let me remind this chamber of what some of these challenges are. A predicted 39% increase in the number of over 65s by 2031. By the age of 65, two thirds of people have a long standing illness, and this rises to three out of four people aged 75 or over. And people with a long term condition are twice as likely as those without any to be admitted to hospital and stay in hospital disproportionately longer. Of more concern to our health and social care providers is also the predicted 80%, 86% rise in the number of over 85 year olds by 2031. Too many older and vulnerable people end up in hospital when they shouldn't, and too many stay there much longer than is needed. In fact, up to 90% of people who fall will be taken to hospital, whether they need to be or not, as this has been the accepted pathway. To change this will require a not insignificant shift from traditional models of care which have tended to focus on deficits and problems needing to be named and fixed, to one which is asset-based and sees the patient's own experience and knowledge of their condition as a resource that can be built upon to support resilience and self-management. And it will also be essential that we enable our AHPs and support staff to meet the growing demand for their expertise and interventions. Rehabilitation is not a new concept. It was in fact established around the time of the First World War, 
supporting soldiers to recuperate and adapt to life after service injury. <clears throat> it is fundamentally a partnership between patient and therapist, as well as family and carers. It's not a passive process and is heavily reliant on the motivation and participations of individuals to recover and adjust, to achieve their full, full potential, and where possible to live full, productive and active lives, whatever their age. Improving community-based rehabilitation and enablement services needs to be integral to the prevention of dependency on healthcare and support services through the promotion of independent living. This includes the provision of equipment and adaptations which are highly effective and cost effective at keeping people independent and active in their own homes. In fact, for every one pound spent on adaptation, there are savings of up to six pounds or more or on, on more expensive services that would otherwise have been required. The National Falls Improvement Programme has succeeded in driving this kind of improvement through co-production across health, social care, ambulance services and local communities. In Argyll, for example, there has been a 50% reduction in hospital admissions after a fall. Without the further, further evolution of strategies such as rehabilitation and enablement, for example, costs of health and social care over the next 20 years for all ages are expected to rise by about 2.5 billion. The Christie report published in 2011 estimated that as much as 40% of all spending on public services is accounted for by interventions that could have been avoided by prioritising a preventative approach. Somebody Sandra White. Th thank you. Thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. Uh, would the Minister agree with me in recognising the role that housing associations such as Build and Trust uh, have, the work that they do in their communities to keep you know, older people in particular uh, living more independent lives? Minister? Yes, Sandra White is absolutely uh, correct. And I read uh, Build and Hanover Housing Association's uh, contribution to this debate and uh, Clearly, for example, in adaptations of social housing, that is absolutely key. The integration legislation we have put in place and the preliminary work of the integrated joint boards have put us in a strong position to now accelerate the pace of improvement and shift our focus to prevention, early intervention and enablement, which will achieve the outcomes of integration and support people and integration and support people to live independently for as long as possible in their own homes and communities. Jenny Mara. I thank the, the Minister for giving way, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure she'll have noticed in, in the briefing papers like I have that um, not every joint new joint board on health and social, social care integration has an AHP representative. And given the AHP's key role in letting people stay in their own homes and uh, removing delayed discharge and that integration agenda, would she agree with me that really all boards should move to that level of representation? Minister. Um, it's, I, I take very much on board Jenny Mara's point, but you know, we want to keep integrated joint boards um, as focused as possible, and they could become great big bodies which might not be as focused on the work ahead. Um, but I know that they all recognise uh, the key importance of AHPs in making sure that integrated services work. Um, <clears throat> and very much recognise their contribution, and I'm sure they will be communicating with them uh, in, in different ways, although they might not uh, have a seat on the board. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the commitment, energy and enthusiasm that AHPs are bringing to improving care and delivering outcomes across health and social care. They are driving improvement across a range of priorities, embedded in our pillars for public ser service reform, including partnership, building strong partnerships with other agencies, such as AHPs working with the fire service to reduce fire-related deaths in vulnerable groups across Scotland. Prevention through falls prevention partnerships. AHPs are helping to reduce falls in care homes across Scotland by up to 50%. People are being enabled to live life to the full through 
the AHP Physical Activity Pledge. And in case people don't know what that is, that's making sure that everybody has an intervention with the people that they are coming across to make sure that they are taking as much exercise as possible and signposting them to places where they can take physical activity. Children are supported to get the best possible start in life, participating in the curriculum um, and achieving their full potential. Up to 66% of people with enduring mental health problems are being able through vocational rehabilitation to gain paid employment sometimes for the first time. And people with dementia are staying um, a, a part of rather than apart for their communities through Dementia Friendly Community Initiative supported by HP consultants in dementia. And that's why I think the uh, amendment in the name of Jim Hume um, further strengthens um, the motion and we'll be accepting that amendment. Finally, on performance, AHP's contribution to better for performance has been notable through the evolution of new models of care, such as self-referral to musculoskeletal therapies, including physiotherapy. This has helped to redesign orthopaedic services, reducing waiting times by up to 25%, reducing MRI scans by up to 30%, and improved patient experience as well to ensure that those who need surgery will get it sooner. This kind of transformation will ensure that patients and people who use services will get rapid access to the right health professional at the right time. It will also support self-management and help to reduce the overall costs of service provision, as well as manage rising demand for services in a more person-centered way. As well as musculoskeletal problems, people are able to self-refer to HPs for a whole range of conditions. These include communication difficulties, support with independent living, foot health and mobility problems. Patients and families consistently tell us that these services make a huge difference to their health and well-being, and most importantly, to their quality of life. The health economic data would tell us that this work supports our preventative spend agenda and is associated with both cost avoidance and positive cost consequence for public health as well as health and care services. AHPs now recognise the importance of building on their co-production work with local communities to strengthen their preventative approach and place it on a more sustainable footing. This is evident in the partnerships with leisure services who are running exercise classes for older people, people with dementia, and for individuals who are in post-cardiac or need specialist rehabilita rehabilitation, which are enabling people to rebuild con their confidence and stay so socially connected, as well as remaining physically active. AHP leadership will remain key to the rehabilitation and enablement agenda and I'm heartened to see that their leadership role has been recognised and strengthened since the publication of the AHP de National Delivery Plan. I would now like to see AHP leadership better represented on integrated joint boards to make better use of this talented group and the solutions they bring in shifting our paradigm of health and social care towards greater emphasis on prevention, early intervention and enablement. It's now over two years since the launch of the National Delivery Plan. Although significant pro progress has been made, there remains considerable work to be done in the remaining 10, 10 months of its life, and we have a solid platform achievement on which to build. During this period, we will continue to work with and support integrated joint boards and partners across health and social care to deliver on the actions, demonstrate impact, and importantly, to spread embed and sustain the improvements being made across services. I would propose a refresh of the National Delivery Plan with a focus on improvements in population health, experiences and quality of care for people who use services and better outcomes for lower cost across health, across health and social care. I believe a strong theme for improvement should be rehabilitation and enablement as well as a continuation of work to support prevention and early intervention that underpins the new models of care required for sustainable and affordable health care. <clears throat> that is why I'm pleased to announce to Parliament today a new £3 million fund to enable active and independent living for people who are recovering from illness or, industry or injury. 
The fund will help AHPs deliver the active and independent living programme over the next three years. It will aim to help people with in illness, disability or injury find new and innovative ways to lead as healthy as li lives as possible and to stay in their own homes for as long as possible. Presiding officer, I have confidence that for all our differences, we have a shared objective in ensuring that the financial and demographic challenges faced by our health and social care services are met. I look forward to members' contributions today and I will ensure that suggestions received from across this chamber are used to inform our work to ensure continued improvement of the services provided by our AHPs to enable active, independent and productive living for all. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move amendment number 13196.2. Ms Mara, 10 minutes or thereabouts. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today and for the, the opportunity to take part. Can I also um, start by um, commending her, her announcement today for the £3 million for the um, Active and Independent Living Fund. Um, she knows as well as I do the incredible work that the allied health professionals do in our communities, especially with our older and vulnerable people. And I'm sure that that announcement of funding will um, make, make an enhancement um, and allow them to do more of that work. The Minister read out um, a long list of, of these professionals. I would add and probably repeat physiotherapists, occupational therapists, community pharmacists, radiographers, chiropodists, speech therapists. And the rest of these skilled professionals are absolutely critical to delivering the independent living that we want for all of our communities. I think every family in this parliament, in the public gallery across Scotland, um, see members of their own families um, trying to live independently in their ageing years and perhaps struggling with that and being assisted by um, these people who show immense patience and courage and uh, human skills to, to, to support these people. These professionals are the front line of our NHS, going daily into people's homes, providing early diagnosis and treatment for people, ensuring they get quick and appropriate support. And by doing this, this type of intervention, they are also lifting the burden on our doctors and consultants and our nurses and reducing costs at a time when our NHS budgets are under pressure. And as a varied and multidiscipline group, as we have agreed, I think it is fair to say that the 12,000 of these workers across Scotland classed as a, a allied health professionals perhaps do not feel they have the status um, as some of their colleagues in the health service, but are absolutely critical to um, that service nonetheless. We must recognise the central role that they will play in realising our shared ambitions for the, the 2020 vision in this parliament and our ambitions for a truly integrated health and social care service, allowing people to remain in their homes. It is these professionals' experience, flexibility and expertise that will be vital in linking the different parts of our health and social care system enabling to do their job effectively. And we can ensure that that way that patients do not get clogged up in the system as we have too often seen in the past. Presiding officer, in 2012, the Scottish Government described the allied health professionals as agents of change. This was no understatement, and I'm glad that the Minister has renewed uh, that role for them with the refresh of this strategy today. The National Delivery Plan, launched in 2012, was a welcome framework for the targets and ambitions that have been set for the last three years, and we recognise and credit the progress that has been made. It was widely welcomed by those in these professions as giving them a proper role within the community-based NHS that we all agree is the right way forward. And now that we've reached the end of that three-year span, there is a natural break in which we can take stock of this progress, understand if we are getting it right and set out what we still have to do. 
And given the importance of the allied health professionals and the ongoing integration of health and social care, I believe it is important that we remain vigilant on the effectiveness of our support for these workers. I welcome the Scottish Government's own progress report, which sets out the milestones we have already reached. A 52% national completion rate by the end of last year is a significant achievement, but one which leaves us with much still to do. So we have set a welcome and agreed direction of travel, but it is important that we mark out the distance and how we, get, how we make progress, good progress in this journey. And today we are supporting calls on these benches from many of the allied health professionals for a national audit to assess how far we have come and what challenges need to be addressed. That audit would allow us to set robust measurements, smart objectives and a plan to deliver going forward. And I'd be very keen if the Minister, perhaps in her closing remarks today, might say if she can um, put that audit into uh, her strategy. Presiding officer, can I say um, that I think this is a good time to, uh, to describe. I actually spent yesterday sitting in a multidisciplinary team meeting in a local practice in the northeast of Scotland. And um, I would suggest to any member of the health committee or the ministers or any parliamentarians who are interested to, um, to ask to go along to a multidisciplinary team meeting to, to get a flavour of exactly how the incredible work that these professionals are doing. Because a multidisciplinary team meeting is, I think, um, a model of excellence of how we deliver health and social care. And the way it works is that GPs, um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, district nurses, social work and the hospital consultants all sit round the table and discuss a list of patients where they all are if different people round the table have different information about these patients in their home how they can help each other to prevent them perhaps um, being admitted to hospital and um, getting them into hospital if they need to do so how they can monitor their medication the community pharmacist is involved as well and it is a real model of people working together I think working efficiently communicating with each other um, and managing this process properly Presiding officer, I was struck yesterday as I was struck at the last MDT meeting I sat at uh, just a few weeks ago um, to see the enthusiasm and dedication of each and every one of those people around the table, no matter which job they were doing in our National Health Service, to care for these patients, to care for them as individuals and to make sure that they are leading quality lives at home from the occupational therapist chipping in to say does this person need um, a frame or do they need um, a, a different type of commode from the district nurses monitoring the, their medication um, and all of that then the person who's keeping the record so that the GP knows next time they come in the system that um, I saw yesterday was absolutely excellent and it's a testament to the contribution that these allied health professionals can actually make um, to care and especially older people and vulnerable people's care. That's why I'm delighted that we're having this debate today and the Scottish Government has set out this strategy um, to mark their role in, in the system. Presiding officer, can I, in the last couple of, of minutes, um, turn to physiotherapists and a couple of concerns about workforce st statistics? Because we can see from the latest statistics that the number of senior physiotherapists has fallen considerably. I think, um, perhaps the Minister will correct me if I'm wrong here, but as a cost-saving measure. For example, those in band 7 has decreased from 731 whole time equivalents in September 2010 to 652 by the end of last year. And this sharp reduction in physiotherapist clinicians with specialist skills in various fields will mean that we are less likely to make the early assessment and provide treatment which can improve outcomes and pre prevent uh, re-referrals. 
The loss of this specialist expertise is likely to cost the NHS more in the long run and can only have a ne negative impact on care. Presiding officer, can I say at this point as well that I've been really struck um, the short time um, in, in this brief about the, the innovation that physiotherapists can actually make in our National Health Service. I was at a meeting in this Parliament just a few months ago when a nurse uh, from the Western Isles was talking about how physio can actually uh, prevent a, 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 a few weeks uh, training programme of physio can actually prevent incontinence, especially um, in women, and can actually um, prevent the move to something like mesh implants. Um, and I was really struck because we've had the debate on mesh implants in this chamber. We know the dangers of the mesh implants. We know the potential litigation. We've had um, patients here who have been severely uh, disabled and affected by mesh implants. We also know that mesh implants cost £15,000 uh, per implant. And to say that physiotherapists can actually provide a course of exercise and preventative seems a much more holistic and essential and preventative um, way, of, um, way of working. And I would ask the Minister to perhaps reflect on the role of physios in innovating and preventing that drive to acute treatment and to surgery when she is assessing, as I've said, that cut in numbers from 731 to 652. Presiding officer, we know that by investing in allied health professionals, we can reduce the burden and cost in other parts of the NHS, as I've just highlighted, while improving patient care and reducing inconvenience. We saw a recognition of this from the delivery plan in 2012, um, which put the role of AHPs on a sounder footing, and we welcome the refresh today. Yet the representations we have received from the various groups lead us to believe that we need this audit to back up the government's new strategy. And I hope that the Minister will consider uh, the Labour amendment today and put that audit into her strategy and support these allied health professionals in our community. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jim Hume to speak to and move Amendment 13196.1. Mr Hume, a generous six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And of course, I also thank the Minister for bring, bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, I welcome the new fund uh, and look for details of the criteria uh, for accessing uh, that fund. Perhaps that will be mentioned in the summing up. Uh, this is very welcome, this debate today. It gives us a chance to shed light on issues in health care that haven't really been given enough attention, I don't think. Just as someone would uh, not live in a house whose foundations are there, but whose roof and walls are missing, we cannot have a successful debate on the state and future of our health care without the discussion of allied health professionals. At a time when we are on the brink of enormous changes in the way that health and social care are administered through the integration of the two, it's vital, I think, that we ensure proper attention and support is given to everyone involved in this process, which, as I said in previous debates, uh, the devil lies in the details from the outset. Allied health professionals are a vital and core group in this plan. Their input in what type of support and what kind of efficiency is most effective and should therefore be listened to. Their expertise in seeing what works on the ground must inform policy making. What the more than 11,000 uh, allied health professionals do for the support of the acute and primary care services is irreplaceable and in fact something that should be given more attention and support. In its briefing to the Scottish Government's 2015-16 uh, budget, the Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland raised numerous points which should be alarming for the general direction of uh, government prioritisation. It said that money is not shifting in line with policy, even though we've had a small announcement today, uh, meaning that although there are increased expectations of allied health professionals, there hasn't been a sustainable matching investment in AHP provision. So we've learnt that on top of increasing de demand, frontline AHP service we're facing cuts of well over the 3% of the target efficiency savings that was set as a goal by the Scottish Government in its draft budget. Although there's been a real terms increase of funding for the NHS, a 
A striking example is the 8.8 per cent budget cut between 2010 and 14 for speech and language therapists, with cuts across 10 out of the 11 health boards and local authorities, with some cuts as high as 21 per cent. We also know that GPs are not referring people suffering from mental ill health to therapies, as in their words, the therapies aren't there to be referred to. And of course, I give this chance to repeat the call for mental ill health to be given parity with physical health, Ill health, uh, Ill health in, in the statute books. If healthcare is to be made efficient and more accessible, there has to be a focus on a sustained and effective workforce planning. Allied health professionals note with concern that workforce planning is still not integrated and that this has to occur in a systematic way rather than short-term piecemeal solution. This takes into account the, the environments that allied health professionals have to work in, both in hospitals and healthcare environments, as well as the private homes of many patients receiving their care. So the importance of a healthy, steady and safe housing environment where care is provided should be stressed as an urgent priority. We now know that almost 1,000 elderly people were left this past winter on waiting lists for home care packages, with health boards unable to provide them with basic help they need for washing, cooking and transportation. But this isn't a problem that will solve by uh, simply throwing money at the problem. Prevention and planning have to start at the earliest stage possible. Audit Scotland said that 90% of clinically able people over 65 and up to 50% of people over 85 are unable to leave the hospital because of lack of arrangements in their care, support or, or accommodation. This is a critical factor in relieving hospitals of their many pressures and overstretched resources. And having safe and reliable housing uh, to return to after hospita hospitalisation is, of course, extremely important. Build, Hanover and Trust, the three largest uh, Scottish pr providers of housing, care and support services, of course, tell us that the growing elderly population is in urgent need of such caring environments that can provide solutions to their needs. In addition to housing, we know that some conditions are exacerbated by the health inequalities that some communities and people face. So I echo the concerns of organisations in the allied health professions who call for solutions to cross boundaries between social care environments such as education, justice and local government. By empowering local governance, we will uh, also be able to empower a lot of people who are essential in providing those health services. The Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland has said that AHPs working across these boundaries are in a position to deliver optimum productivity gains. So this would translate, of course, for potential savings and flexibility to allocate resources in a more efficient way across the entire NHS, simply spend to save. Presiding officer, the care provided by the allied health professions goes way beyond the care for clinically able people to return home. This is an issue that must be tackled in the prevention and early access to the necessary uh, services, including mental health services, from physiotherapy, uh, dementia care too. The allied health professions, professionals are part of a framework that is indispensable for keeping an ageing Scottish population healthy. However, instead of seeing support for the long-term and sustainable development of these professions, what we're seeing is a decrease in numbers of staff for some of these professions. And Jenny Mara's uh, amendment has mentioned this with the therapists. There's been a 10 physiotherapists. There's been a 10% decrease in senior physiotherapists posts since 2010, as well as a steady vacancy rate in all allied health professions. Post, uh, all allied health profession posts of more than 400 whole time equivalents across Scotland. So there's no wonder that GPs aren't referring those suffering mental ill health for some therapies when therapists aren't there to be referred to. So the trends wor worryingly mismatched with the needs arising from an aging population with complex and increasing uh, needs. And the fact that one in four of us will suffer mental ill health at some stage uh, raises uh, uh, this is a more important uh, issue. Presi presiding officer will be happy to therefore support the uh, Labour amendment. We'll also support the, uh, the, the motion in the name of uh, Maureen Watt, and I'm glad that she'll be also supporting uh, my amendment, which I move in my name and look forward to support from across the chamber. Many thanks. I now call on Dr. Nanette Milne, a generous six minutes. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to discuss the valuable and indeed essential contribution which AHPs make to the health and well-being of people right across Scotland at every stage of life, helping them to manage their long-term conditions and to live their lives to the limits of their capabilities. Everybody here recognises that our health and social care services are facing unprecedented demand, predominantly from the large and increasing number of people who live into advanced old age with a complexity of manageable long-term conditions but also from young people who can often now live productive lives with conditions which previously would have resulted in death during childhood, such as some forms of muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis. And this demand already with us is set to grow as the population ages and faces the impact of dementia, cancer and the many other degen degenerative conditions that may accompany, ad accompany advancing years. Acute services are already feeling the pressure with the number of people aged 65, over 65 attending A&E departments up by 12.6% between 2009 and 2013, and 60% of them likely to be admitted to hospital, compared with 23% of patients under 65. And once admitted, we all know how difficult it can be to get care packages with ensuing delayed discharge, which is not good for the patients whose stay in hospital is prolonged, often for many weeks, and is to the detriment of other patients who require hospital treatment but can't get a bed. There's widespread agreement that the status quo isn't an option, and that as stated by the Scottish Federation of AHPs in their briefing on the 2015-16 health budget, the NHS in Scotland needs sustainable reform to shift the focus of investment and services away from acute-driven, disaggregated provision towards prevention, early intervention and self-management in a context of community-based integrated services. The Scottish Government recognises this in its 2020 vision for the NHS in Scotland, a vision that's already been extended beyond 2020, which is desirable and appropriate. This envisages a healthcare system where there is integrated health and social care, a focus on prevention, anticipatory and, self, and supported self-management, and on ensuring that people get back home or into a community setting as soon as appropriate and with minimal risk of readmission. AHPs have a key role to play in shifting this balance of care into the community. There are nearly 11,200 whole-time equivalent registered AHPs working in Scotland's NHS and social care services, with others employed in local authorities or the third sector. They make up over 8% of the NHS workforce, almost the same as medical and dental staff, and they have the diverse skills and expertise which are key to supporting self-management and enabling active, independent and productive living at all ages. Many areas of government policy have a significant impact on the demand for AHPs, such as the Early Years Framework, the Early Detection of Cancer, the National Falls Programme, the Dementia Strategy, and the improvement of services for heart disease, stroke, diabetes and other long-term conditions, to name but a few. Access to clinical interventions for people with long-term conditions can be inefficient, and the self-referral system, which has proved to be very effective for physiotherapy, could be used to equal effect in other conditions such as women's health and continence services, respiratory services and stroke and falls, preven stroke and falls prevention. Physiotherapy has a very important role to play, particularly in the support of older people and their families and carers through care pathways from living at home to hospital admission to supported return to living at home through to a decision to enter, enter residential or nursing home care. It also has a major role in the management of dementia, stroke and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in supporting people to continue living at home and in residential care to help them maximise their independence, their function and their quality of life. So the £3 million fund announced by the Minister this afternoon will, I'm sure, be very welcome to the physiotherapists, occupational therapists and all the other AHPs who work so hard to maximise their patients' mobility and independence. Overall, as the motion states, the AHP workforce has gone up recently, but the increase is very modest. And in speech and language therapy, for example, between 2010 and 2014, there was an 8.8% reduction in funding with a significant cut recorded in a number of health boards and councils. And we're told that frontline AHP services continue to experience in real terms budget cuts above the 3% efficiency savings required of NHS boards. So whilst we all acknowledge the essential contribution made by AHPs in many disciplines and their cost effectiveness to the NHS by enabling people to live in the community for as long as possible, 
and we all want to see the successful integration of health and social care in Scotland. I think we do need to pay heed to Audit Scotland's warning that the government is facing significant challenges in making the changes required to achieve its 2020 vision within the financial resources available. And pointing out that these changes need to happen while the NHS continues to provide services to meet the current needs of patients. I also note the recommendation in the Audit Scotland report that the Scottish Government should review current financial and performance targets for the NHS and the planned indicators for integration joint boards to ensure they fit with the implementation of the 2020 vision and that milestones should be introduced to measure the progress of health boards towards more preventative and community-based care. Together with the College of Speech and Language Therapists' comment that the Government currently has no strategic AHP workforce planning group, I note the Federation of AHP's concerns regarding the current unidisciplinary nature of workforce and workload planning and their desire for workforce planning policy to address the capacity of all professional groups working throughout the integration care pathways. And I'm gratified that the Minister appears to agree with this ambition and look forward to progress on this. So, Maureen, what? And Annette Mill makes an, uh, an important point on speech and language therapists and um, that workforce has increased by 3.1% uh, during the period and we are developing a transformational children and young people's AHP plan and that's one of the deliverables from the N NDP which will be published later this year and I hope she looks forward to that. Thank you. Annette Thank Mill. you, President Officer. I find that information very encouraging. We have in Scotland a highly skilled AHP workforce with a wide range of skills and the ability to support people to maintain their health and well-being throughout life. But if we're to use these professionals to the optimum ben benefit of the communities they serve, they must be an integral part of planning for the future. And I think should have an important leadership role in developing the integrated services. And I'm glad to hear that the Minister is of the same mind on this. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, we will support the Government motion and the amendments, but I hope the Minister will pay heed to the concerns I have raised as she oversees the development of integrated health and social care in the months ahead. Thank you. Excellent. Many, many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Um, there's quite a bit of time in hand this afternoon. Call on Sandra White to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, can I welcome the announcement of the £3 million fund uh, from the, the Minister? It is most welcome, and I'm sure that uh, everyone here welcomes it as well on behalf of not just the health service, but uh, for the constituents also. Uh, I also would uh, like to mention the fact that the number of allied health professionals in NHS Scotland has increased by 26.2%. I think that's a fact that uh, is very, very welcome. And also the implementation of the AHP National Delivery Plan 2012-2015 is demonstrating significant impact across Scotland. I believe that AHP's expertise in rehabilitation and enablement will be the key to supporting our vision of health and social care integration, which many of the previous speakers has already mentioned. I think it's also to be noted that uh, for individuals and families, particularly older people and those with dementia or complex needs, HPs play a central role in helping them to live self-determined, independent lives wherever possible, uh, in their own homes, avoiding unnecessary admissions uh, to hospital or care settings. AHPs can make an immediate impact on the lives of older people with long-term conditions, dementia, and ensure resources are used to best effect by preventing unnecessary admissions to hospital. As convener of the cross-party group on older people age and ageing, I do intend to base uh, my contribution on the issues of older people. Uh, presiding officer, uh, people in Scotland are living longer, which I think is good news. Uh, not only do we want to ensure that people are living healthier, uh, long lives, but we want more older people to be supported to stay in their own homes and within their local communities. HPs can play a key role in this. Annette Milne, I think, has put forward very well the work that is done in the communities by AHPs, uh, which is very, very welcome. Over the last 10 years, overall, life expectancy in Scotland has increased. Male life expectancy increased in all areas of Scotland from 2001 to 2003, 2011 to 2013. And female life expectancy increased in most areas over the same period. And that's statistics from the National Records of Scotland 2014. Our older population is likely to increase by around two-thirds in the next 20 years. 
And because of this, we do need to change how we deliver care. I think it's why it's very important we do have integrated care, and we have this debate today as well. Uh, presiding officer, 90,000 uh, people in Scotland have dementia, and that number is expected to double over the next 20 years. Scotland's first dementia standards, 2011, states that everyone has a human right to safe, effective care, which protects and promotes dignity in all care settings. Anything that falls short of that is totally unacceptable. Scotland's National Dementia Strategy points to the role of AHPs in its delivery, noting the growing evidence that may support the active non-pharmacological, and I'm glad I got that one correct, interventions delivered by AHPs. Uh, HPs are working to ensure that self-management and choice are at the forefront of the delivery of services to people with dementia. They are doing this through the development of dementia-friendly communities, partnership work, sharing HP experience online, uh, such as uh, social media and online communities, and supporting the training of a skilled and informed workforce. Uh, I'd also like to touch on the National Delivery Plan, Action point 2.4 of the National Delivery Plan calls for AHP directors to work with directors of social work to support older people and those with disability and complex needs to live independently in their own home or homeless setting. However, I do note uh, from the progress report of February 2015, there's still a number of challenges over fully implementing this, although it is worth noting that the progress report states that it is now been realised as a result of the need for the enablement and integration agenda to be achieved first. And I wonder if uh, the Minister, perhaps in her summing up, could comment on how this next step uh, could be achieved and, and promoted also. I would also raise a point uh, on the Labour Amendment, uh, which uh, obviously Jenny Mara has raised. Uh, we're calling on an audit of the National Delivery Plan. I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm looking at the National Delivery Plan and I do have a bit of concern about the amount of time or work or even monies which would be put forward for an audit there. Uh, we looked at the, the progress report was produced in February and there's ongoing updates on the delivery. And in my mind, not perhaps in everyone's mind, in my mind it was, seemed to me to be a bit premature to have an audit before the plan has been given time to run its course. And the fact that there is continual progress reports being put forward, I wonder if it's actually needed. But that's, as I say, only my opinion on that particular part. The other point in the progress report is the fact that only a few health boards have embedded the work of the National Delivery Plan in their local development plans and local performance management arrangements. So it is getting a bit difficult, I think, to get a clear picture of the delivery of the NDP. And I would also ask the Minister if in our summing up, you could perhaps address this point also. Uh, basically, they point out the fact that they also complement the idea of an independent living that the NDP seeks to achieve. Their point is that whilst there is focus on ADPs and delivery plan without their infrastructure, the aims perhaps would be quite hard to achieve. If I could just mention in summing up the importance of uh, housing associations, I know Jim Hume had already mentioned this, uh, they not only provide housing obviously but care and uh, support services and they've already been mentioned, build and trust uh, Hanover Housing. Now they do contribute greatly to the needs of a diverse and a growing older population. And I would hope in forwarding with the delivery plan that the housing associations are fully consulted and I'm not asking them to be sitting on a board or anything else. I know they have enough work to do. But uh, the way they continue with the, the work they do, uh, you know, for housing older people to help them live an independent life, I think it's something that we should all be looking to achieve. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you. Um, too often when we talk about health, we are focused on services provided in traditional health settings, such as GP surgeries and hospitals, by doctors and nurses. Most healthcare does in fact take place outside hospitals, but the work of allied health professionals is hugely underappreciated in our society. From arts therapists to therapeutic radiographers, these health workers make an invaluable contribution to the well-being of those suffering from illnesses and disease across Scotland. We must recognise the fact that each branch of allied health professionals possesses core specialist knowledge and skills. 
Allied health professionals together share many common attributes, such as a patient-centric approach to healthcare and unique abilities to assist in rehabilitation. Virtually all allied health professionals offer direct and specific interventions to patients, but they also work closely with other allied health professionals and other medical professionals. What the Chief Health Professions Officer has described in the past as the allied health professional family represents, as she has noted, a diverse group of professions who, as members of multidisciplinary, multi-agency teams, provides a wide range of interventions and contributions to promote good mental health and recovery from illness. Let me discuss further the need for the work of allied health professionals to be part of an integrated programme of health care. The delivery of care should not be a tug of war between health boards and local authorities. Integration goes beyond cooperation and coordination of autonomous bodies. True integration is about softening boundaries and the emergence of a new work unit. That is possible only when we recognise how tensions arise and when boundaries become lines of defence. People need accountable, clear and truly integrated health services. They need responsive services in which professionals who support them work together to build local networks, knowledge and continuity of care. It is critical that through integration, the emphasis is on health and well-being, not sickness. The time of compartmentalised service provision must end. General practitioners, third sector organisations, allied health professionals, frontline staff, patients and service users must be part of the decision making for integration to work and decision making must be clear and coherent. Beyond ensuring that we get the structural aspects of integration right, the difficulty of merging cultures lingers. It will take, take strong leadership and a secure framework that provides the right environment to engender a new work culture. Active and independent living is of the utmost importance to people of all ages and circumstances. A sense of independence and control over one's life is something that many people take for granted. Someone suffering from a chronic or mental illness, for example, cannot take independence and control for granted. It is imperative that we ensure that people suffering from such illnesses are supported into active and independent living. The work of allied health professionals is invaluable in achieving this. Doctors and nurses are often unable to provide the sort of time and commitment to people with such illnesses as they would like. A GP has little over five minutes with, with each patient on average in Scotland. This is clearly not enough to provide more than a cursory evaluation of someone's difficulties, let alone the in-depth assessment required for many people. It is in these circumstances that allied health professionals step in. They provide help and assistance that is of equal, equal value to that of a GP, but crucially, they can give the time needed more than a GP can. That's not to say that allied professionals are not extremely busy, however, of course they are, but it's intrinsic to what they do that they provide a patient-centric experience, and this is the true value of many allied health professionals. Yep. Green what? Um, thank you, and, and I, I, I congratulate um, Jane Baxter for her really good contribution, but does she agree with me that that's uh, why it's so important that the allied health professionals have been really proactive in moving into the communities and now 80% of AHP activity is in the community, exactly where she says they should be. Yes, um, I would absolutely agree. Um, speaking from my own experience, um, about five years ago I had cancer and the health services gave me great treatment and made me better, fixed my health, but it was the voluntary sector and the services I was able to access locally that taught me how to be well and to change my approach to my life, so I couldn't agree more with the point you make. We, sorry, just I've lost my thread. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we must recognise that with an increasing older population in Scotland and their well-established wider care needs, that there is an even greater need for appropriate health and social care assistance. We have all received a briefing from Beald, Hanover and Trust Housing Association. In it, they note that bed blocking and boarding is placing pressure on the current health and social care system for older people, affecting patient safety, patient care and patient dignity. And despite recent legislation, the potential opportunity for housing associations to help deliver independent active living through the delivery of health and social care solutions remains undervalued and underused. This goes to the heart of my next point. The work of enabling active and independent living is not completed purely by allied health professionals. 
It is only in partnership with housing associations, local authorities and other bodies that an active and independent life can be sustained for many people, particularly older people. As I have already noted, this integration must be at the heart of everything that is done in this area. We should look at ways to enable close ties to develop between these organisations and allied health professionals. I think there is broad agreement across this Parliament that patient-centred health policies are the way forward. There are clear economic benefits to helping people back into their homes rather than keeping them in hospitals or other facilities where space and staff and resources are at a premium. But there is an, an inherent social value in helping people who can lead an active and independent life to do so. No one would prefer staying in hospital to being at home. Allied health professionals do incredible work in supporting people. We must recognise the value of their work and create systems that help them to do it. To sum up, I think it's important that we adopt a holistic approach to ensuring that people live active and independent lives. Allied health professionals are undoubtedly a central part of this. In this Parliament and in our communities, we must work to make sure that the Scottish Government follows through in its promises to create an atmosphere conducive to allowing allied health professionals to support everyone who needs help in living an active and independent life. I think we can all agree that collaborative and consensual approaches Utilising the skills of a diverse range of health professionals from a broad range of bodies is the best way to foster this atmosphere. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, just picking up before uh, getting into the centrality of what I want to say, one or two things that have been uh, said in the debate so far. Uh, Jenny Mara uh, talked about and seemed to imply, perhaps she didn't, uh, that really each type of AHP should be represented on local boards. And I, I'm glad to see she was not intending to say that, uh, because certainly the smaller a board is, the more effective it is. And just simple arithmetic tells you why that should be so. If you have three people in a board, the links between the people are three in number. If there are six people in a board, they have multiplied to 15. If there's nine in a board, it's 42. And when you get to a dozen, it's 74 links uh, to each of the people. And that is why when boards get bigger, they slow down and impede delivery. I will. Any I, I thank the member for giving way. Just for clarity, it was not my intention to suggest that every allied health professional is represented on the board. As Maureen Watt and I made clear, there, there are so many, but perhaps there is some representation of allied health professionals as a group. Dr Stevenson. Um, I understand where the member is coming from. Uh, that's a helpful clarification. However, I don't think boards are about representation of anybody. I think boards are about getting the right mix of skills, knowledge and experience. That is likely to lead to HPs being there, but I don't think they should be there as of right simply because they're HPs. Now, let's turn to the subject itself and not get uh, bogged down too much in management speak, which we might uh, otherwise do. I think all of us in our uh, casework uh, that we do as constituency and uh, regional members it will give us a pretty good insight in some of the issues that are around this subject. Uh, people rarely come, particularly older people, with an issue which neatly fits into it's the Scottish Parliament's responsibility, in particular older folk. I often find when you examine the issue they have, it touches on what Westminster is responsible for, what we are responsible for, and what the Council is responsible for. And our job is to tease out the issues uh, and find out who can help. So therefore, the whole debate which has uh, been around breaking down barriers, I think, gets to the essence of it. And our role in our constituency casework is to do that, and the role of allied health professionals and everyone involved in social care and the health service is, is, is there to do that. Um, Jim Hume also uh, talked about uh, psychiatric help, and I absolutely agree with him there. Uh, and I was particularly uh, pleased uh, that the Child and Adolescent uh, Mental Health Service workforce has risen by 24% uh, in the last uh, six, five and a half or so years. Uh, and that contains uh, extra help, for, for, particularly for young people uh, with mental health uh, problems. Uh, that, that's really important. Now, it's important, too, that we look at what HPs are. Uh, when my father became a GP in the 1940s and spent most of his working life in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, uh, there weren't very many formal recognised AHPs around. My father's probably slightly unusual that he used to send people 
uh, if he felt he couldn't do very much for them to uh, people like chiropractors, uh, which was somewhat frowned upon by his professional colleagues, but actually for a proportion of the people he sent, it worked. Now, of course, things are much better because we have formal qualifications, we have training with protocols for integrating that uh, particular discipline and many others into the range of support uh, that, that we can provide. The whole point about the way we now work together is that it's based on evidence-based models of uh, practice and focus on rehabilitation uh, after illness uh, or difficulties of one sort or another, integrating social care and health care. That's, that's the important thing uh, that we want to see. Now, of course, we've got uh, the benefit of a progress report from February, uh, and that tells us some interesting, uh, interesting things. First of all, it tells us about the local delivery plans. We've got planning down at the grassroots. Uh, but, of course, planning is the easy bit. It's delivering on the content of the plan that's actually the difficult bit. Uh, I spent much of my life uh, managing very large projects, and my uh, guru uh, was Professor Fred P. Brooks, who wrote the wonderful book, The Mythical Man Month. And uh, his, his advice to anybody who's involved in a project of any kind is just do it uh, and cut the size of your team if you want to do it faster. Uh, there are things uh, that uh, we see in the report which are quite interesting that have come up in this parliament before. Uh, we see substantial progress on foot care guidelines. Now that sounds a very simple little thing. I know that Mary Scanlon in particular, I think I'm correct from memory, uh, has spoken about that on a number of occasions uh, uh, over the piece uh, in the last decade probably. And if we keep people moving, their health improves. If we keep people moving, they can go to the shops, their social interactions are better. So sometimes it's quite straightforward interventions that make a difference. And so therefore it's uh, uh, fairly good to see uh, that we're making progress. As we get older, uh, the risk of falls grows. Uh, and again, uh, on falls, we're seeing progress, but also opportunity uh, for more progress. So I think uh, the audit which the uh, Labour Party's uh, uh, amendment to the motion refers to, in essence, what you might get from an audit is already being uh, delivered. I think uh, if you have a formal audit, you send in the auditors. All that you actually end up doing uh, is slowing people down and diverting effort away. So I think the choice of word may be wrong. What I would suggest we might consider doing, which isn't currently on the agenda, instead of perhaps looking at an audit, uh, and I would encourage the Labour Party to think about this and all colleagues, is perhaps having, like local authorities now do, having an improvement service that makes sure the good practice, of which there is plenty among the range of professionals we're talking about here, is picked up refined and presented to those who will benefit from knowing of the good practice of others. If we're to spend more money on oversight, I suggest uh, that that might be uh, more like the kind of oversight uh, that we'll do. Now, in conclusion, pre presiding officer, uh, let me just, uh, like Jane Baxter briefly did there, uh, draw on some personal experience. About 30 years ago, I had a tingling sensation start at the back of my neck. And over a period of months, it eventually reached the outside of my thumb and the outside of a finger. And at this point, I decided it was perhaps time to go and consult uh, a professional, and I, I did so. And the moment I described the symptoms, uh, the, he knew exactly what it was. And he offered me three options. He said, we can send you for an operation to cut a little bit off your spine because you've got a trapped nerve and the bit will cut off. We can do acupuncture or I can do manipulation. He then paused and said, and I can do the manipulation now. So I said, let's try manipulation. He sat me on the couch, put his knees on my shoulders, pulled my head up about half an inch, turned it through 90 degrees, folded it forward. There's a great crack. And he said, you'll be okay, but you'll be sore for a few days. That one intervention that lasted approximately three minutes has stood me in good stead for 30 years. That was an allied health professional really doing his job. I'm immensely grateful. I hope they all are as successful for everybody else. Presiding very, officer. Very glad you survived. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer. And someone did say, yeah, follow that, but I've 
I don't think I'll be discussing many of my ailments today. You'll be glad to hear. Thank you, President Officer. And before I begin, let me first say that I am grateful to be given the opportunity to speak in today's debate, where we all in the Chamber today can recognise the role and celebrate the valued contribution of allied health professionals in health and social care and their vital role they play in our communities, leading the way to enable people an independent life out of hospital or residential settings. Allied health professionals, known as AHP, are a fundamental part of our health service who works across all of the three areas of health, social care and education, while having a particular expertise in enabling approaches which, make, which makes them an essential component of our health service. AHP are a key NHS staff grouping in the development of rehabilitation services, which include physiotherapists and occupational therapists. I am sure that everyone in this chamber will agree that AHPs develop in innovation and creative solutions to health challenges and are an asset to our NHS. The term used for them is merely an umbrella term which covers anything from dietitians to therapeutic radiographers. And these are a sector of our health force which make up 8.2% of the total almost equal to dental and medical staff. Since the publication of the AHP National Delivery Plan in 2012, AHPs have been able to have a much more desired effect through facilitated groupings and working together to give significant service transformation and improve outcomes for people and communities across Scotland. The delivery plan is a significant document offering important recognition of both the role and contribution of AHPs in health and social care and the potential of these professions to deliver improved services across the health and social care sectors. It remains essential that the allied health professions are valued for their specific and unique contribution in service provision and in the wider aims of the health policy in Scotland. However, an audit of the National Delivery Plan for the Allied Health Professions in Scotland is essential in order to provide support for the AHPs by understanding the areas that are most in need and to focus on performance of self-referral as a primary route for access. This is important as, in order to meet the complex need of our modern population, we need multidisciplinary teams and to use our knowledge of populations and risk stratification tools available to us to direct patients more effectively and efficiently to the treatment pathway which is right for them. Services need to be accessible to the growing number of patients in all communities with long-term conditions. People with long-term conditions often have the best insight into their condition and know when they need a clinical intervention. For them, one of the biggest frustrations of the current system is that they feel that they have to start from the beginning each time. This is also the most inefficient way to provide health care. Self-referral to physiotherapy is already tried and tested, having been advanced in Scotland, particularly a referral to specialist services. However, there are many other services, such as women's health and continence services, respiratory services, stroke and falls preventions, where self-referral would deliver considerable benefit to patient care. Although there has been substantial increase in the AHP workforce in the NHS in Scotland between two, the year 2000 and 2010, I am extremely concerned over the loss of senior clinicians. As the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy stated, the reduction in the number of senior grade roles means the experience and knowledge of those clinicians will be lost to patients. NHS Scotland workforce statistics reveal that there has been a 10% reduction on senior posts since 2010. These posts are critical, critically vital as specialist clinicians deliver the leadership and expertise for improving patient care. 
and have a very positive impact on the quality of life for many patients. Therefore, it is important that a long-term plan to reverse this trend is established. In conclusion, presiding officer, it is vital that we continue to pay tribute to all of the HPs for the changes that they are making in delivering new models of care, supporting self-management, innovation and improved outcomes, and enabling independent living for patients and their families, all of which are essential to secure sustainable and affordable health and social care services for the future. However, I also believe that an audit of the AHP National Delivery Plan published in 2012 is required in order to identify areas of good practice and provide greater support for all our allied health professionals in Scotland. Thank you. Thanks very much. I am now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Bob Donis. A generous six minutes time, minutes time for interventions, etc. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to take the opportunity to commend the services delivered by allied health professionals across my constituency in, for example, Hay Lodge Community Hospital in Peebles, Eastfield and Pennycook Medical Practices, the link to allied health professionals for many people. I uh, want to begin, however, with that metaphorical cradle to grave and, first of all, reference from the um, National uh, Delivery Plan, this particular uh, sentence. Many young people who encounter the justice system as a result of offending behaviour have existing speech, language and communication difficulties. It is clear that there can be a connection between such difficulties in early years and the social and behavioural impact in later life. This was evidence to the Justice Committee in a session we had inquiring why children who are alienated from school then progress uh, from disruptive offending behaviour to criminal activities. And we took evidence from speech therapists. And it was riveting and it has stayed with me to this day. Examples were given which you may very well recognise of the young mum perhaps who has the buggy gets on the bus, the baby's fed, watered clean, but the baby's got a dummy tit in its mouth, the mum's texting all the way or on her mobile, doesn't communicate with the child at all, gets off the bus, still not communicating with the child. Compare that with a mum who gets on the bus, the child's looking at her, she makes faces at it, interacts with the child, the child looks across the bus towards other people who then interact with the child. This is early communication where an individual learns its place within society, learns to read expressions, to understand sounds that are encouraging and otherwise. It's very, very basic. But the speech therapist made it plain if it goes wrong then, it can stay going wrong. Right through early years at nursery, through primary, where the child may in fact become detached and quiet and inhibited, or become the bully and start causing trouble because they don't know, frankly, just how to get along with people. And that may lead them, in fact, into in, uh, finally graduate into a life of crime. So that really brought home to me something I never really thought about, how important speech therapy was, language and communication, right at that early stage, even when it's without words. And then we move on to the grave part, or one foot in it, perhaps, an elderly population increasing, 70 is the new 60, I certainly hope so. But of course, with age comes wear and tear, both physical and sometimes mental. The role, the access to physiotherapists and occupational therapists is more important and the sooner the better. That access is more important than the mechanic to a much loved but vintage vehicle. For Stuart Stevenson, let me say this, my late father always said, you must take care of your feet as they keep you upright. So, podiatrists, I'm on your side. And it's not a light-hearted comment because there isn't always access to podiatrists for elderly people. And once you can't move about, you can't move about. And it's literally downhill. But for some, the body, I'm not looking at in particular, Mr. Stevenson, soldiers on with occasional first aid but not the mind. 
The role of art and music therapists is absolutely crucial here, stimulating those recesses of the mind where memories of self and past may just be waiting to be unearthed, even if only temporarily. I'm thinking of Newton Grange Mining Museum service there. This lady is not actually a drama and arts therapist. Her name is Alison Shepherd. She's actually an educational support officer. But she's got lots of wee boxes. And each wee box is a memory box for a different decade. And each wee box relates to different mining communities. These stimulate and bring back to mind to people who've perhaps just been sitting vegetating in care and residential homes and they cheer up and their eyes brighten and they remember things from the past. Each one of us recognises the perfumes of the past which bring childhood, oh, a moment, a time alive and a basis sometimes attuned for memories, good or bad, come flooding back and even take us unawares. The smell of wildflowers, and I'm back guddling for taddies in the Nunya Canal, and my mother's standing on the bridge screaming at me to get back from the dirty water. Melodic whistling, and I can see my dad stravaging back from his work. We are all cut from the same memory cloth, and for some, it's the only route to retrieving for a time that individual who once was. So, we've talked about allied professionals abroad, but I want to focus on the drama and art therapists, just in case nobody else does, because they and they alone sometimes can bring back people that were lost. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Cara Hilton. Um, thank you, President Officer. It seems uh, a, a fair while ago now that uh, the Minister started off this debate opening up by giving a, a huge long list of allied health profession, uh, professionals that were, were, were rhymed off and finishing off, I think, uh, last but not least with speech and language therapists. It's always a risk when you seek to thank a, a long list of people, or in this case professionals, in case you miss someone or, or some profession out. I'm sure, looking back, the Minister would not have made such, a, su such an error in the opening of, of this debate. I think uh, 13 uh, identified allied health professions were, were, were mentioned, representing over 11,000 professionals. Um, I want to come back later in the speech about adding to that list, not perhaps health professionals, but, but adding to that list. Um, so the value of allied health professionals, I think, during this debate is becoming increasingly recognised. Indeed, it was recognised in the 2012 to 2015 EHP National Delivery Plan that other members have referred to, which was seen as a key driver towards reducing unnecessary admissions to hospital, reducing the length of stay when in hospital, and helping people remain happier and healthier in their homes for longer. Um, there has been much discussion also in relation to the numbers of allied health professionals. Now, in a seven-year period since 2007, uh, it's been put on record by colleagues that there's been a 26 point 2% increase in allied health professionals. And I don't say that as a, as a figure to give the government comfort, or there's a separate reason for giving that, that figure. And for occupational therapy, the increase was 3.5%. For physiotherapists, it was 9.8%. For radiographers, it was 21.2%. So, for example, why 3.5% for OTs? Why not 2% or 7%? Uh, for radiography, why 21.2%? Why not 10%? You know, these numbers have to have a meaning underpinning them for why we get to them and for why we have that amount of HPs within the system. That's the reason for reading out the, the numbers, although it is, of course, a good thing that we have more of them, and I should put that on, on the record also. Uh, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. Uh, I, I want to... Um, speak of some things, some general issues that have also been raised today, but in my personal life there have been issues that uh, have affected me and my, my family as well. In, in relation to strokes and TIAs, uh, are they always detected when they happen? If they do happen and they're not detected, or if they're detected and treated as relatively minor, are we aware of the muscle wastage that may have happened in a very minimalist level to begin with, where if there's not 
quality physiotherapy follow-up, then you find things such as significant muscle wastage over a series of years and compounded also by the likes of if you become frail anyway. You can't use a walking stick or a zimmer because of the frailty perhaps with your, your limbs. I think that's something where allied health professionals have got a key role to play. Uh, Jenny Mara mentioned continence issues. Um, I have to say I've been working uh, with um, some fantastic uh, continence nurse specialists in Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, in relation to uh, some of the work they do and that incontinence is not an inevitable aspect of growing older, particularly for, for women, but not exclusively to women, and that um, uh, the issue can be reversed and mitigated, and that continence issues also relates, if I get the terminology right, to gait syndrome, which increases the likelihood of uh, slips, trips and falls at home for older people, and urging continence, of course, to older people through the night rushing to the bathroom and the, the heightened uh, risk of falls there, the isolation and the stigma that comes with that issue. Uh, so not just allied health professionals in relation to that, but I think I have to put on the record nurse specialists have a key role to play. So whether or not physiotherapists are, as Ms Mara said, were the most appropriate intervention at that point, I think nurse specialists have a key role to play in developing that service or on delayed discharge. Um, where the Scottish Government has said they want to give 200,000 bed days back to individuals and families by 2017, and £100 million is to be invested in that. The reason I say the £100 million is that much of that money won't necessarily be spent in traditional ways, but perhaps in non-traditional ways, actually making sure that older people's houses are fit for purpose, that they are you know, slip, trip and fall proof, that when they get out of hospital, they're less likely to be readmitted. Some real uh, prevention stuff there, and the roles that OTs may have in relation to that. Or indeed, I have to say, uh, it could be specialist housing officers that could have a key role to play in that with their housing association movement, or it could be, uh, it could be the, the care sector as well. I, I said um, that I wanted to come back to the list of uh, the numbers around the increase in allied health professionals when I started my, my, my speech and how we get to those numbers. Um, actually, I, I don't know what those percentages should be um, because we've got a whole series of health and social care integration boards which are getting off the ground at the moment, and each local area will have their own strategy for dealing with much of, uh, of these aspects. And when they do have that strategy, they should have a workforce planning model around that. It could be different in Glasgow than it is in Grampian, because they may set different priorities and different pathways. So yes, we need a national framework, but I'm very much minded those figures I, I, I mentioned we need an underpinning behind that. I think there's issues about how we do national planning around that, particularly for empowering local health and social care integration boards. I also said that perhaps it shouldn't be allied health professionals. If we have health and social care integration, is it not allied health and social care professionals? And we have to really uh, build up the status of the, the care sector. So the, the much demonised 15 minute uh, home care visits that we've heard so much about. I have to say I would rather have 30 minutes and 40 minutes. Of course I would. But for older people isolated at home, that point of contact to nurture their mental health, a cup of tea and a blether for those 15 or 20 or 25 minutes becomes essential. Surely that's part of workforce planning and building up the status of allied health and social care professionals. So I'm just trying to build out a, a picture where I think, yes, we should use this debate to recognise allied health professionals, but everything is interlinked at a local level and that local development planning. I'll finish off with one final appeal, I think, the presiding officer. And again, it goes back to the status of the, of the care sector. There are many young people out there who want to become nurses who may not have the qualifications yet to access that course. You know, two, three, four years uh, in the residential care sector with a clear career progression support pathway around towards becoming a, a nurse may be one of the ways to build up the status of that profession because the wonderful job they do on pretty low pay, it has to be said, right across the country is absolutely exceptional. Yes, uh, they are not allied health professionals, but they are allied health and social care professionals. And at a local level, when we do our planning, they must also count as well. And I hope the Minister will take that on board in the, the debate we have this afternoon. Excellent. Many, many thanks. And I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Colin Keir. A generous six minutes.
Um, thank you, President Officer. I am grateful to have the opportunity to take part in this important debate on the allied health professions and their vital role in enabling active and independent living. Uh, can I begin by, um, like other colleagues, commending the hard work and dedication of all who work in the allied health sector. Uh, my oldest son has benefited greatly from the support of both the Occupational Therapy Service and also the Speech and Language ther Service. And I commend the contribution being made not just in our health and social care services, but also in our education services too. There is absolutely no doubt that allied health professions have a huge potential to deliver even further improvements across health, social care and education. And this was rightly recognised in the Allied Health Professionals Delivery Plan published in 2012. But I think the changes Scotland and our health service are facing means that the sector does need a lot more recognition and it does really need to be at the centre of Scotland's health and wellbeing policy. And I think we probably agree that across the chamber. Um, the Minister has outlined the scale of the, and impact of the demographic time bomb that Scotland faces, and this obviously can never be underestimated. By 2033, the number of people in Scotland over the age of 60 will have gone up by 50%. The number aged 85 and over will have gone up by 144%. And well, it's great news that people are living longer. Our economic prospects are obviously going to, um, we're going to, need to are dependent on us put, paying a lot more attention to keeping our ageing population fit for work and ensuring the quality of life for them in retirement. In this respect, early access to services such as physiotherapy and rehabilitation in the community can pay, make a huge difference to outcomes and to people's well-being often reversing much of the impact of disease and disability, reducing the need for hospital admission and social care, and help, helping people stay in the workplace. It is crucial that in our approach to health and social care policy, we not only recognise the vital contribution that allied health professionals make, but that we give them too the value and the status that they deserve in our National Health Service. Right now, this is not always happening, and I would like to take the opportunity to highlight the Unison Scotland report under pressure, Scotland's occupational therapists speak out, which surveyed Unison members on the state of the service and its future prospects. The Unison survey found a dedicated but frustrated workforce finding it increasingly difficult to deliver their service. 57% were concerned about the impact of cuts on the service. 60% said they had to cope with less staff. 82% re reported increased workloads. Many said that pressures on, bu on budgets meant that the professional assessments were overruled and the recommendations were overturned. And where they were approved, people were facing longer and longer waits to get the equipment and adaptions that they needed. And obviously, this is having a huge negative impact on people's quality of life. The OT surveyed by Unison said that changes in the way that services del are delivered meant that they were spending more time on assessment and form filling and less time focusing on patient care, and that changes elsewhere in the care system and the NHS are often having a knock-on effect on occupational therapists, who sometimes feel that they are not fully or appropriately utilised in the planning process, particularly for patient discharge. The result is all too often, as other members have highlighted, that patients end up being readmitted to hospital and caught up in a revolving door due to the gaps in support, which can make independent living very difficult. To quote one Unison survey respondent, despite evidence showing an increase in OT can actually reduce the length of a hospital stay, improve patient experience and, and increase or maintain healthy living, there is still a requirement to do more with less. And this is leading to budget cuts, staff, staffing issues, poor morale and poor patient experience. We have all got constituents who are paying the price of the, pre the pressures faced in the, OT, in the OT service and the gaps that are continuing to exist between health and social care. I would like to highlight the example of one of my constituents in Dunfermline who is 87 years old and has prostate cancer. My constituent needs a walk-in shower as he simply does not have the movement to get in and out of his bath. He has been told that he is not a priority and that he should wash himself at the sink, despite the fact that he can barely bend, which makes this very difficult. He is currently on a long waiting list for an OT assessment and, and has been told that nothing can happen, nothing can be done before this happens, so he has had no option but to pay privately for a carer to come and bath him twice a week. He can barely walk and he is virtually housebound. My constituent has been told that there is simply not the funding available right now for anyone that is deemed in low or moderate need and that he would likely only qualify for a care package and adaptions if he becomes critical. Of another constituent who suffers from dementia and recently had a bad fall down her stairs, a social worker has confirmed that adaptions are needed, but nothing can happen until there has been an OT assessment to authorise them. 
four months on, she is still waiting for the assessment to happen. And these are just two examples of how the pressures and gaps in the service are having a real impact, everyday impact on people's well-being and quality of life. So occupational therapists, like other allied health professionals, contribute greatly to people's welfare and well-being. They can transform people's quality of life, but I think right now too many of them are feeling undervalued, overlooked and under pressure. And this needs to change, and it's absolutely vital that the central role of the health allied health professionals is fully recognised, fully valued and fully reflected in how our health and social care services are designed and delivered. And that's one of the reasons why Scottish Labour's amendment is calling for an audit of the um, HHP delivery plan to make sure this happens. And it's also why we want to see action from the Scottish Government to address some of the shortfalls, such as the number of physiotherapists. Recent NHS Scotland statistics show that there's been a 10% drop in senior physiotherapist posts since 2010. And this is obviously a loss to patients and to the NHS at a time when we should be shifting more towards preventative spend and care. Yet investing in services like physiotherapy would not only dramatically improve people's well-being and quality of life, it would also generate real and substantial savings for our national health service, as the Minister has acknowledged herself. Scottish Government figures on emergency admissions to hospital show that 86% of over 75s are admitted as a result of unintentional injuries, mainly falls. And in the briefing for today's debate, the Chartered Society for Physiotherapy highlight the false prevention economic model that they've developed to support health boards in identifying how they can best protect people from falls. They estimated that 19,000 falls could be prevented in Scotland each year through improved access to physiotherapy-led prevention services, saving many lives and saving the NHS £27.1 million a year. Indeed, for every £1 spent on physiotherapy, the NHS would get back £1.49 in savings. So, in conclusion, today's debate is a welcome one. It's great to see the work of our allied health professionals celebrated across the Chamber. The delivery plan is a welcome step forward, but I do think more needs to be done to ensure that the health professionals receive the recognition and the support they deserve. And much more needs to be done to ensure that people can have early access to the occupational therapy and, physical and physio physiotherapy services they need without beginning each time from scratch and fighting every step of the way. Thank you very much. And I now call Colin Keir to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, in calling me for this debate. Uh, first of all, can I welcome the new £3 million fund as announced by the Minister? I'm sure it will become uh, invaluable in, as we take the, uh, the services that we've been talking about forward uh, in the coming months. It's been clear for a number of years that the way that our health system works is required to be changed. Reflecting future demographics is vital. We are living longer. The decision to work proactively towards a system of prevention instead of reaction, I think we all believe is the correct path to take. And with the integration of health and social care, it's clear that the connection between the old ways of doing things have been broken. And I firmly believe that the new integrated boards should and will value and take cognizance of the so the allied health professionals and the work that they do. I think this is absolutely vital. I also believe that the comments that uh, Stuart Stevenson made in terms of the size of the boards being uh, faster in reaction uh, as well as coming with uh, uh, better outcomes will uh, be the way forward and I'm sure that this will happen. It's really, it, it, the, the change is definitely required and I'm sure will happen successfully. So I'm delighted that in this motion we're, that we're debating today, it highlights and recognises the work done by allied health professionals. They really are seen in some cases as the, uh, the ones who take second uh, billing behind doctors and uh, uh, senior medical professionals, when in fact they are really the thing that holds our health service together. And the skills which uh, have been brought into not just health but social care are so vital in changing the services that we provide for the people of our country, bringing our health service well into the 21st century. I'm delighted that there's been a rise in numbers of the health professionals, allied health professionals involved with well over 11,000 individuals, uh, although Bob Doris says this could be uh, seen as a just an arbitrary number. I believe the Scottish Government is showing how valued allied health professionals are. And in the 
AHP National Delivery Plan, this clearly gives a direction of travel that we must take in order to look after future needs. As the Minister pointed out, there are some extremely good results that have come out of the NPD, NDP uh, progress report from February this year. I found, certainly within my constituency, numerous stories relating to the help uh, allied health professionals have given. One of my favourite stories, and I'm sure people such as Mary Scanlon, Christine Graham and uh, Stuart Stevenson might appreciate, is actually on the story of podiatry lady I was speaking to just the other day who is in her late 70s and has struggled for some time with uh, problems with her feet actually can get around. Now it's not the fact that the podiatrist who dealt with this lady was successful to the point that she's still mobile. It was the fact that she remembered the same problem being faced by her mother some years ago who unfortunately didn't have the same level of care and had to endure much more discomfort especially in her final years. And it's all, whatever we say, it's all about the quality of life. I can tell you that my constituent fully understands why we have podiatrists in our health service, such as being the effect in our life. And of course, we all want to see more people spending more time in their homes and in their communities. And the work that the allied health professionals do in trying to ensure that people of all ages spend less time in hospital and care is invaluable. I've seen examples of this on a number of occasions in my constituency. If it wasn't for the work of the AHPs, many of my older constituents uh, wouldn't be living uh, or would be living in full-time care. Enablement programmes are superb examples of why we require allied health professionals because, in particular for the elderly, enablement allows this independence, it's community, but it's only workable with the H, uh, allied health professionals. Now, like Jenny Mara, I've sat through multidisciplinary meetings at health centres uh, over the past number of years. And the one thing that you cannot help but notice is the real professionalism shown, and even more importantly, is that these people really do care. It's not just an action or a job for them. Working with doctors, allied health professionals, I've found to be extremely impressive. And our constituents want to live in their, their life as normally for as long as they can within their community. Of course, AHPs don't just deal with adults with physical diff difficulties. As Nanette Milne and others pointed out, virtually every strand of society requires the help of AHPs, helping kids get the best start in life, those with mental health issues, and helping those with extreme complex needs, amongst other things. An example I'd like to give would be one that's really quite close to home for me uh, and I've seen. And yes, it's physiotherapists, um, nothing to do with me, but my father who was terminally ill with Huntington's disease. And it was a case of, uh, for someone who requires one-to-one uh, -one care or required one-to-one -one care when he was alive uh, towards the end and the involuntary movements and the difficulties that he had, the work of the physiotherapist was absolutely phenomenal and made life so much easier in the long term uh, for him while he uh, was in care. I'd like to uh, also take up the point Bob Doris said about people working in the care uh, system, not just those within the National Health Service as such, but those uh, working in care homes and the likes. They have been undervalued and really do need to have the respect and authority and the training to bring everything to the same standard and be seen by the public in that way as well. It's not a second-rate system. It is something that we should uh, help as far as we can uh, possibly go. Uh, just on a couple of other things, something I hadn't really thought about uh, until uh, fairly recently and something that Christine Graham brought up actually was in terms of the drama and arts therapists and the, the sensory perceptions that bring out with the colour, sound and smells. Absolutely fantastic for people who really do require uh, that kind of help in bringing through the memories and perhaps a better quality of life. Other issues, of course, workforce planning, Bob Doris brought up uh, absolutely right, and I believe that in the way that we're going forward, I don't think we require the audit, but perhaps I might be proved wrong. I tend to agree with what Stuart Stevenson said. So 
Finally, presiding officer, all I can say is that these people who we call allied health professionals are not just people on the periphery of the National Health Service. They are absolutely vital to it. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Richard Lyle to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by saying how much it is a privilege to speak in this debate on the allied health professionals, particularly as a member of this Parliament's Health and Sports Committee, but also because it serves as a, an opportunity to recognise, as the motion states, the invaluable contribution that allied health professionals play in prevention, early intervention and enablement in supporting the health and well-being of the people of Scotland throughout their lives. And I also, uh, like many other members this afternoon, welcome the extra funding that the Minister has announced today. Presiding Officer, I am sure that this SNP Scottish Government recognises the importance of AHP's contribution to the lives of the people of Scotland and also recognises the wide range of allied health professions in Scotland, which shows the depth and breadth of skills that lie within the sector. In total, there are 13 allied health professions in Scotland, from arts therapists to paramedics, physiotherapists and much more. And in total, they represent over 11,000 individual professionals. They are so important as they are the only professions expert in rehabilitation and enablement at the point of registration. Their expertise in re rehabilitation and enablement will be a crucial part of supporting the introduction of the 2020 vision for our National Health Service, which we in this chamber have discussed on many occasions and will help the people of Scotland to, to be able to live longer, healthier lives at home and will deliver only key, on key NHS quality outcomes. Presiding officer, it is clear that the work of AHPs is vitally important, but none more than for individuals and families in particular older people and those with dementia or complex needs. AHPs play a central role in helping them to live self-determined and independent lives. Patients and carers consistently report that all these services make a significant difference to their health and well-being and, importantly, their quality of life. This is clearly something which I know this SNP Government recognises and I was pleased, President Officer, that under this Government there has been an increase of by 26.2% within NHS Scotland of the number of allied health professionals during the period 2007 to 2014. The largest percentage increase between the 30th September 2007 and 31st of December 2014 was seen in prosthetics, up to 149.5%, and with notable percentage increases in multi-skilled and orthics with a 130% and 90.6% increase, respectively. The implementation of the AHP National Delivery Plan 2012-15 is so important, and already it is a plan which demonstrates significant impact across Scotland. The plan, launched in 2012 and developed in line with the 2020 vision, calls for AHPs to be more visible, accountable, and impact oriented. The implementation of the actions set out in the National Delivery Plan for AHPs is demonstrating significant impact across Scotland, as AHPs contribute to the reduction of unnecessary admissions to hospital and to the reduction in the length of stay for those who are acutely ill and for whom admission to hospital is the most appropriate option. As ever, there is always more we can do. And the Government, I am sure, is always striving to improve and to get better. That is why, in the remaining months of the delivery plan, there should be continued work with and the support to the boards to deliver on the actions, demonstrate impact and, importantly, to spread, sustain and embed the improvements made across services to truly make it work for the people of Scotland. Allied health professionals are a vital element of the delivery of primary care, providing professional skills that add value to the services a practice can provide. Acting as a first point of contact, practitioners, AHPs make a vital contribution to faster diagnostics and earlier interventions in primary care. 
working closely with general practitioners and community teams to provide alternate pathways to secondary care, referral and prevent, prevent admissions in areas such as falls prevention and musculoskeletal services. AHPs make a significant impact on the lives of older people with a long-term condition and dementia and ensure resources are used to best effect by preventing unnecessary admissions to hospital or care. Whilst also working towards this SNP Government's vision for children and young people in creating a Scotland that will be best placed in the world to grow up. AHPs have a vital role to play in the delivery of the Early Years Framework Agenda in areas such as early intervention uh, and anticipatory care, prevention and health promotion. In particular, the provision of speech and language therapy can support children with communication difficulties to access the curriculum and to achieve their full potential. To conclude, President Officer, it is clear that AHPs play a truly invaluable role in delivering essential services for the people of Scotland and ensuring that they live long, happy and healthy lives. We should all be proud of all those who work in the allied health professions and indeed who work in healthcare here in Scotland. They truly are changing people's lives here in Scotland also, and we should salute them all. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And now call Hans Alamalik to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I hope that the Minister will accept Jenny Manor's, Manor's uh, amendment from the Labour Party. It is a pleasure to speak about the importance of allied health professionals and the vital role they play uh, in our health service. Allied health professionals, in short AHPs, work with people of all ages groups across a wide range of communities and hospitals. AHPs, contribution to health provision, health improvement and recovery of illness and injury, supporting return to work, enhancing quality of life, which I'm sure we all agree with and it is so important. The AHPs delivery, delivery plan 2012 gives recognition of both the roles of contribution of AHPs in health and the potential of these uh, professionals to deliver improve, improved services across the health and social care sector. The AHP's National Delivery Plan has provided an excellent opportunity for AHPs across health, social care and the third sector to work together in delivering the services that our communities today need. Evidence shows that early access to um, physiotherapists and uh, rehabilitation in the community can result in improved uh, diagnose and care. And disability in individuals can be identified far sooner and rectified and therefore reduce the number of um, frail elderly people being readmitted to hospital and dependence on social care. So far we have a cross-party agreement on the important role the allied health professionals play and the wider concept of its integrated and health and social care functions. Now I get to the outcomes. The progress report on the AHP's national delivery plan is an odd document to say the very least. It gives percentages of completion rates of NDP's actions. Now, if you don't know what that means, that's okay, that's fine, because frankly, it means very little. The progress report has no analysis of whether there is a right targets or if action has been good or, or not. The AHPs or the people that they serve have benefited or not in reality because of the percentage system that has been shown. Evidence, uh, evidence from my constituents indicate that self-referral progress doesn't quite work as smoothly as it ought to. A constituent tried to phone for an appointment for a relative and had to wait over a week after eventually leaving a message on a phone machine. And then it took another three weeks before appointment could be got. 
So clearly there is improvements to be made. No system is perfect, I accept that. Uh, however, self-referrals to uh, physiotherapy is, is already an established fact of Scotland, and therefore one expects that to be reasonably smooth running, particularly in cities like Glasgow. However, the institution of physiotherapists highlighted that there are many other services that could benefit from self-referrals delivery. Uh, and once again, I, I say that uh, if people are facing difficulties already, and uh, that will only compound the situation. Uh, and also, may I also go on to say that the aim uh, ultimately in Scotland is to change a culture in the way we deliver health services. This takes a long time, and we need a proper audit to see whether that really pro that there's real progress is being made or not. We need to look at what is working and what can be done to better the service. Without these audits and statistics, it's just not possible to actually um, measure whether uh, the work that is being done is reaching, reaching its conclusions. Bob Dollis also mentioned the fact that there are a lot of young people who may want to be nurses one day or aspire to be nurses, could possibly work with allied health pr uh, professionals. I would guard against that type of uh, intervention because it may well mean that the allied health professionals may come to depend on them, and that in itself is a dangerous slope to go down because the job they do is very professional and very important, and I think that uh, you really need the, uh, the appropriate qualifications uh, to be in the service in the first instance. I have to say that I have made several inquiries because traditionally as a, as a councillor, I, I do know that a number of constituents did go for um, th these services, and I know that they historically felt that the appointments they were getting were far long, and the service was very, very slow, and they felt that the, slow, the service could be improved. Once again, I, I appreciate that, that that is a matter that there is always room for improvement, and I think that as long as there is room for improvement, we should strive to do so. But I also want to say that the work that they do is very valuable. I also once had the need to go to uh, receive uh, services for uh, an injured knee. And I have to say that the service I received was excellent. I have to say that the advice I was given was very good, uh, and it helped my recovery uh, tremendously. And I don't think that my doctor was in a position to do that type of uh, service that the, uh, the professionals were. Uh, therefore, um, I want to say that, one, I want to thank all the people in the service in the first instance, but I also want to say to them that my heart and soul goes out to uh, supporting the, the aims and objectives that they have. If, for example, they're looking for additional services, which they seem to suggest they do, then for that there needs to be a very clear vision of what they want to do, what direction they want to travel in, and how they intend to audit that. I think auditing is essential. The current report that we have in front of us, quite frankly, was wasteful. I think it could have been better, it's a, it's a lost opportunity. I think we need to be more clearer, not only in what's happening in, in Glasgow and Aberdeen and Dundee, but nationally as well. So we need to have two sets of figures, one showing us what is happening in local areas, and we, are, we need another report that shows us what is happening nationally, so we have a very clear picture of what is actually happening and what services we are receiving. So therefore, uh, I would really, I'm really interested to hear from the minister what her feelings are about the services in terms of its future. Uh, I would also like to say that we would very much want to support uh, the, the improvement in the service. And also, I'm, I'm quite happy to see the service extend its services uh, further in the, in, in the health service if, if they can help the service uh, continue to build on its current success rate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we do still have a little bit of time left if members wish to take interventions. Mike McKenzie to be followed by Michael Russell. Thank you, President Officer. It's an unfortunate irony that in terms of health care and in many other areas of social policy, we're becoming a victim of our own success due to the simple fact that we're increasingly living much longer than previous generations. Indeed, perhaps the biggest challenge we face in Scotland, as in other Western democracies, is this ageing demographic. And this is especially true in the Highlands and Islands region, where lifespans tend to be longer than the average 
And this is exacerbated by the fact that for generations we have exported our younger people and more recently we have begun to import older people. Retirement migration has become a characteristic of almost all parts of the Highlands and Islands and especially in our more rural areas. And this throws up particular challenges for rural health care delivery. And this ageing demographic, along with a number of other factors, mean that it's important to realise that we can't depend on traditional methods of delivering health care. One aspect of evolving a rural health care system to meet this challenge involves spreading the work much of which was traditionally carried out by GPs, often in single-handed practices, without much assistance at all, amongst, uh, and, 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 and so, the, uh, so it's therefore important to spread this work now in the 21st century amongst a much wider group of health professionals. Certainly. Hans Malik. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. And I think you're, you're almost uh, mirroring what I was suggesting earlier on in the sense that we have statistics and figures for not only in certain areas but nationally as well because hopefully that will pick up exactly what you say in terms of areas where there is a shortage of professionals and we want to try and make sure that the community data doesn't suffer because of that. So we try to find a, a cure so that that doesn't happen and we have a good service right across the country. Mike McKenzie. I thank Anzala Malik for the intervention and I have to say that I'm very pleased to say that I agree with uh, what he's suggesting and I'm glad we're of one in this area of in, in, in this challenge. Um, the, the, the group of allied health professionals includes art therapists, chiropodists, diagnostic radiographers, dietitians, drama therapists, music therapists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, prosthetists, speech and language therapists, and, and more. And it's important that we realise that all of these allied health professionals can help share the work of delivering health care and have a very important role, uh, role in doing so. And much of the focus of their work is about allowing and facilitating people with health problems con to continue living in their own homes rather than being admitted to hospital. <clears throat> and there is therefore a preventative aspect to this as well as a role in assisting people who have been discharged from hospital. In my previous career and work as a builder, I sometimes worked in collaboration with occupational therapists who were recommending alterations to homes which would allow people with medical conditions or with disabilities to continue living at home. And the opportunities for facilitating this through imaginative and not always expensive alteration go far beyond the uh, the, the scope of the disability access dealt with, for instance, in building standards. Um, I think there's a genuine opportunity there for some better design thought and creativity which can pay large dividends in allowing people to continue living high-quality lives in their own homes despite health problems and disabilities. And I feel that this is a challenge that perhaps some of our architects ought to take up because there is real scope there and uh, real, real opportunities for improving the design of homes, not just meeting the, the requirements and the building standards as a minimum. President officer, if I may, I would, I would take the opportunity of singling out and paying tribute to one such occupational therapist with whom I worked, Elaine Robertson, Michael uh, Russell, I'm sure will know Elaine Robertson, um, who in her previous role brought both care and creativity to her work as an occupational therapist and who, since her retirement, has continued to serve her community as a councillor in her Gallen Butte Council. And long before integrated health and social care was really properly brought into being, Elaine Robertson was putting these principles into practice by informally networking across a whole range of professions all of whom 
knew and respected her. And this is perhaps an aspect of rural uh, community life um, where people do tend to know each other that's helpful in facilitating this good practice. And it is this sense of community and of humanity that's, I'm pleased to say, is still prevalent in many of our rural communities, where people relate to each other in a way that goes beyond their professional job titles or their job descriptions. And that's, I think, is one of the most uplifting aspects of rural life. And it's in this sometimes informal space that the work of our allied health professionals sometimes takes place and which makes their work so valuable. And it's this type of work that's often difficult to quantify and to put a value on. And that, presiding officer, is precisely why we categorise such work as invaluable. Many thanks. And our final open debate speaker is Michael Russell. Thank, thank you, presiding officer. And this is indeed a vitally important subject to our every area of Scotland and for every citizen. All of us will require and do get services from allied health professionals at each stage of our life. Mike McKenzie has mentioned the particular challenges in rural Scotland and in an extreme rural constituency like our Gyland Butte. Uh, there are a large set of challenges for all healthcare professionals, whether they're allied health professionals, GPs, or those working in the, in the hospital service. Those are problems of distance and travel, professional support, and indeed problems of recruitment. There are similar problems for rural GPs and for health delivery right across Argyll and Butte. And Mike McKenzie is right to mention the work of uh, uh, at least one of those persons who has moved from being a health professional into Argyll and Butte Council. Uh, there are many other people to whom we should pay tribute, working right across the area from Campbellton to Dunoon, from Tobermory to Inverary. But they're not only challenges, they're also opportunities. The Minister at the start of the debate mentioned pro uh, progress made in reduction of falls, leading to a reduction in admissions. Uh, Christine MacArthur is the NHS Highland Coordinator for Falls. She gained a PhD from the University of the Highlands and Islands when she was working on the island of Butte, studying community involvement in health care with research that she did on Isla. She was able to build and del deliver an enormous and important range of skills from living on an, in an island community and working with island communities. Now, the Minister has also indicated, and it's good news, that the number of professionals has grown in Scotland, even in rural areas which have recruitment problems. But there is one area of concern I want to raise today, and that is a decline in numbers in art and music therapists. Art and music isn't an add-on to life. Its creativity liberates individuals. It focuses us on our common humanity. It helps us to make connections. It adds to our sense of well-being. It lifts us from depression. It gives us purpose. In short, it makes us better. And it can make us and keep us well. I was lucky to see that recently in Glasgow. I visited an art therapy class. And NHS Glasgow is very clear as to the effects of art therapy. Its website says, and I quote from it, that it expects to see from the art therapy it invests in a reduced amount of drug consumption, shortened length of stay in hospital, improved mental, emotional and spiritual well-being, enhanced quality of service, reduction in workplace violence and increased job satisfaction in staff. That's an enormous range of achievements for a single therapy. And there are a number of arts therapy charities and organisations working in the field but they need to have the help of the NHS to allow them to access the widest range of people whom they can themselves assist, and they need positive support from government. Some of those charities have exhibited uh, in this parliament before us has Nordoff Robbins, the music therapy charity, uh, and their approach to music therapy is also well documented and well researched. They undertake a range of inspirational activities, of which I think the one that strikes uh, home most closely is the work that they've done and continue to do in children's hospices. They also list conditions in which music therapy is particularly useful. Autistic spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, mental health problems, what they call life-limiting illnesses, dementia, and profound and multiple learning disabilities. But they go further and suggest that there isn't really any uh, health issue. 
which cannot be touched or soothed by the application of music therapy. Now, I do hope that as investment continues to grow in allied health services, uh, and given the increasing focus on mental health as well, that attempts will be made to reverse the decline in arts and music therapists and to find new ways of allowing as much access as possible to those therapies. And finally, presiding officer, also, of course. We'll give way on that point about um, the arts therapist. I do accept that there has been a reduction in their number directly employed by the health service, but Mike Russell himself said that many are now employed by charitable organisations um, and drama groups, for example, and much of that work is still being done, but delivered by a different mechanism, whether it be through charities or arts and drama groups themselves. Mike Russell? I, I do accept that point, and I think the Minister makes a good point. But, of course, it, it is important that the National Health Service and the Scottish Government continue to support arts and music therapy, even if it is delivered outside uh, the health service itself. It would be too easy for it to be um, uh, essentially contracted out and then to diminish is in importance. But I want to finally, presiding officer, uh, talk about a, a new therapy, a, a therapy which is not much used yet in Scotland, but which could be used in Scotland. It is called reminiscence therapy, which in a sense, might also be a description of a speech by Stuart Stevenson. But it aims, to, it aims to use prompts such as photos, music or familiar items to encourage patients to talk about their memories. It seeks to help those who have mood or memory problems, those who have mental health problems associated with the difficulties of ageing. And it is a fascinating therapy and has an interesting uh, basis. The idea that reminiscing could be therapeutic was first proposed in the 1960s by Robert Butler, a, a prominent American psychiatrist who specialised in geriatric men medicine, and he coined the term life review. And he proposed what many take now as a given. When approaching death, people find it helpful to put their own lives in perspective. In an earlier decade, talking about distant memories was often thought of as living in the past and was therefore discouraged. But the idea behind reminiscence therapy is consistent with the theories of adult psychological development. Uh, Erickson, for example, thought that the great part of adulthood were challenged to find creative, meaningful ways in order to avoid being stuck or alienated. And then in the final phase of life, we may try to review where we've been and what we've accomplished in the hope that we can also feel good about it. Now, research has shown that those elderly people with symptoms of depression who participate in reminiscence therapy uh, develop their self-esteem, they're more positive about their social relations than those people who do not receive the therapy. They also tend to have a more favourable view of the past and they are more optimistic about the future. The results for patients with dementia is not quite encouraging or clear, but mental abilities and behaviour do seem to improve and there is quite a dramatic improvement. In, uh, in stress uh, amongst those who care for these patients. They get more knowledge of the patients and they're able to relax more with them. Now, clearly, as time changes and longevity changes and as health budgets come under more and more pressure, there will be and is a need to help individuals stay well physically and mentally. And there will be new therapies that allow us to do so. All the existing therapies and these new therapies have a role to play in that task. And I hope they will continue to have what has been significant, meaningful support from this government. Thank you very much. That brings us now to the closing speeches. And I call on Jim Hume around eight minutes, please, Mr Hume. Uh, th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think uh, we can all agree that we've had a, an important uh, debate here on allied health professions. Uh, Hans Ala Malik uh, said we've got uh, cross-party support for it. That's absolutely absolutely correct. Many members have given personal experience of uh, allied health professions. I myself have used AHPs to successfully tackle a trap nerve in my neck. So it was interesting to hear the, of uh, Stuart uh, Stevenson reminiscing uh, his experience of uh, uh, having his neck manipulated, his head twisted 90 degrees by a sharp movement. And uh, I do presume that that allied health profession Allied Health Professional was intending to help Stuart Stevenson rather than um, either to kill or, or cure him. But I'm glad it worked and uh, that uh, there is no uh, pain in the neck from uh, Stuart Stevenson anymore. 
Anyway, one important point is uh, the AHPs in many respects have been the enablers for people to lead more independent and very much dignified lives. That's why I want to stress the importance of hearing AHPs' views and allowing their input from the ground to educate, inform and shape policy, especially during the current integration of health and social care. But I also want to point out that this input will not be, do much in the way of getting things right if the right amount of information and data isn't collected from the government when it has to and at the amount it has to. So information gathering and sharing obviously has to go both ways, to and from allied health professions and all of the relevant government uh, departments. The integration project of health and social care mentioned by many, um, Colin Keir, Stuart Stevenson and many others recognise this, is a way for people with conditions such as dementia and other mental illnesses to adapt as easily as possible to their lives with their conditions. And it's to a large extent the role of the different professions within the allied health groups which will enable them to do so. Naturally, I don't discount whatsoever the role of nurses and GPs, as well as our uh, hard-working hospital staff, who provide their time and care to the fullest for all of these uh, people. But we know from experience that when community support is, is lacking for the care of discharged patients, then both patients and their carers can suffer because of resources that just aren't there. Professionals such as speech and language therapists, paramedics, physiotherapists, Dietetics and many more who provide vital services must be part of uh, the plans going forward, whether that's on a board or not. I think Stuart Stevenson's point was, was fair in that they not necessarily have to be on a board, but do necessarily, absolutely necessarily, have to be involved in the process. They'll be the ones able and ready to provide the support to someone who's just been discharged. We know this, perhaps following a stroke and... Uh, and needs the services of a speech therapist, a physiotherapist, and many more experts. Yet we see that the workforce numbers are unable to keep up to pace with the rising number of people with many multiple and complex conditions. And what's more important to, to providing support to the people who have played, and of course are playing, a crucial role in, deli in delivering the Scottish National Dementia Strategy, there are 90,000 people with dementia alone in Scotland. And this number is forecast to double in 25 years. That's 180,000 people with dementia, hopefully within our lifetimes. Through the National Dementia Strategy, these people have the right to one year's post-diagnostic support, as was set in the HEAT target. And this support is being delivered through a number of different allied health professions. Well, I welcome the development of academic programmes for AHP training at undergraduate and MSc levels at Queen Margaret University, the government will need to put its entire weight behind supporting and making sure that people with dementia will be able to receive the care they have the right to receive, as they must do uh, uh, re-giving parity of treatment for those suffering mental ill health with those suffering physical ill health, so that we don't have the situation in the future of GPs not referring those with mental health issues to therapies uh, because, as in their words, the, therapy, the therapies just are not there. The benefits of enabling people to live more independently will have conditions such as dementia and mental ill health uh, and many other multiple and far-fetched benefits for them. They'll allow doctors and nurses in acute care to, to devote more time to other patients. That's just one of those uh, benefits. It will also reduce the burden of the hundreds of thousands of bed days we know are spent on people who are clinically well to go home, and naturally, it will ease the tension from the overstretched NHS resources. Supporting the community is not only right, it's also reasonable. This is why we recognise the service of the allied health professions today, but also call on the government to make its policies and fundings especially more flexible and responsive to the real needs and, con and concerns of the allied health professionals long term. There are three things we need to take away from this discussion. Leadership, funding and workforce. Of the three years the government had to ensure that its AHP National Delivery Plan for Scotland was implemented, there are seven months to go until the end of the year and just slightly over half of the delivery plan is delivered. Clearly, there's a misalignment between what the government promises and what it delivers and the representation of allied health professions needs to be met with actions, not just the words of encouragement. 
This becomes obvious from uh, seeing the lack of allied health professionals representative on those boards and the 10% reduction of EHP consultants in the last three months. Then there's the issue of the workforce, which isn't increasing at the rate needed to replace the retirements from the professions. And finally, there's what many organisations in the allied health professions call the disparity between policy and funding. To put it in their words, the money isn't shifting. We welcome the three million, that we need to have a look at a more longer term uh, funding needs. Presiding officer, the government needs to realise that just as you can't drive on the motorway while looking only in the rear view mirror, they can't set goals while they're practising and achieving them isn't changing uh, fast enough. This is why we have been pressing the government to listen to the experts, listen to their needs and adapt to the realities from the ground. I'd like to conclude by pointing out the importance of developing better policies within the context of AHP's work environment. They're multidisciplinary with a variety of treatments and experts, with some treatments taking months, perhaps years, to take full effect. We can't afford to have short-term and piecemeal solutions to the growing demands of our health care establishment. So I look forward to seeing the response of the government, the Minister today, and changes in its approach to the allied health professions long term. Presiding officer, as I said, we shall be supporting Labour's amendment and the government motion, and I'm grateful that the government shall support my amendment today. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Jackson Carlaw. Eight minutes or so, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we've had quite a long, I suppose one might describe it, and thorough opportunity to discuss the allied health professionals this afternoon. Uh, and can I say at the start that we will support the uh, Labour Amendment and in a spirit of fraternal sympathy to our former colleagues in another place, described there as an elite cadre. I don't know quite how they're known here, but we will support the, the Liberal Democrat Amendment this afternoon too. Uh, can I say that I particularly enjoyed two or three speeches. Uh, Mr. Stevenson's, I, I very much enjoyed Mike Russell's uh, um, sobriquet of describing Mr. Stevenson's speeches as reminiscence therapy. I don't know if Mr. Stevenson was here to hear that tribute, but I did enjoy that and his tingling sensation of 30 years ago, like Jim Hume, to think that the world was in abeyance for those three minutes when we all held its breath as to what might happen next and were either disappointed or relieved accordingly. I very much enjoyed the splendid and confident contribution from Anne McTaggart this afternoon, which I think belied the cruel and unkind traducing of her talents by anonymous Labour colleagues in the weekend press. We in this chamber know her to be among the cream of the Hollywood Labour crop, full of charm, and, uh, and, we wish, and we wish her well. And on the strength of this afternoon's debate, she will be able to recommend various occupational therapists to her former Westminster colleagues as they try to adjust to life in the community. <laughs> Even as the new Southern Hospital opens in Glasgow, um, affectionately, I think, if incongruously and rather unfortunately already known as the Death Star by the medical community and by the local population. Not one hopes because of the seeming prognosis of those who enter it, uh, but because of its shape and size. Even as it opens, our whole um, purpose of health policy is to stop people going to it, is to keep people out of hospital. And the minister, I think, began by telling us that we have a 39% increase in over 65-year-olds in prospect. Two-thirds of those over 65, three quarters of those over 75, potentially with a long-term condition. I think it was uh, Cara Hilton who might have said there was a 140% increase in prospect in those over the age of 85, which gave me great hope. I've previously had to admit that Carlo men don't live very long, so I shall take comfort from that. And as Sandra White, I think, said, a real determination that more and more people should be able to live in their homes and their communities. So I digress just for a minute to return to a point I've made before, that those homes and those communities are actually very much a part of the equation too. And if we are going to ensure that older people are able to live within communities, we have to think now about the type of accommodation that is provided within those communities that will be suitable to help prevent the falls that Mike Russell talked about. Because if they simply live in the large family home to which they've been accustomed and, like my mother, thought they would leave in a box, if that is the attitude, the chances are they may well because it's not suitable accommodation for them if they're going to live to great old age. 
Mr. Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson. Um, while the member makes a very valid point, I think equally we may wish to consider that as we get older, it's more difficult to make new friends and we tend to lose our old friends. So therefore, there is a mental health downside to perhaps leaving very familiar surroundings that I think has to be put in balance. I don't come to any particular conclusion. I just think the issue is very complex indeed. Do Which I is why I have said we need to think now about how we provide suitable accommodation within the community. Because what many older people say to me is I don't. Some For some, uh, retirement living and uh, residential accommodation is appropriate. But some say to me, Jackson, I don't simply want to have conversations about who survived the night. I want to be in a broader community where births and where all the action and activity is a part of my life too. And I merely make the point that I think housing has a part to play in all of this. But our debate, of course, this afternoon was like about allied health professionals. And we regularly heard lists of the various uh, health professionals read out. It was a bit like the, one of those questions on the quiz programme, Pointless. Can you name the list of uh, allied health professionals uh, which nobody knows about? And the, one, the two that nobody seemed to want to have to get their dentures around regularly throughout the debate um, were orthoptics and orthotics, uh, which I noticed didn't regularly get mentioned by colleagues when they, they made the list out. But I think Jane Baxter and Colin Keir both made the point that they are very often unsung heroes, not fully appreciated uh, for the work that they do. But the challenge for them is similar to the general discussion that we have regularly here on health, and that is how in the future, within an integrated healthcare uh, pro profile, with GP practices where we have increasing lists and an aging profile of GPs, do we evolve a model for the future within timescales um, which actually do allow people access to allied health professionals, many of whom sometimes complain that the sort of facilities they are asked to operate from seem to be like the old changing rooms in abandoned baths where it might be that the electricity works some days or it does not. So we need to have a model where allied health professionals can operate as part of an integrated healthcare programme within the community, but within reach and within facilities which make their access and the services they can provide uh, desirable. I want also to talk about, uh, just mention Christine Graham's contribution, which was poetic and lyrical this afternoon, I thought, but she talked about speech and language therapists and the vital contribution they make in early years. And I simply wanted to point out this is very much why Scottish Conservatives have believed in the need of a universal health visiting service, because we have to identify who needs access to these services as much as we need to provide them. And I do want to just say this. I know from having, I will in a second, having hosted events for speech and language therapists before, um, that we might as well not sugarcoat the candy this afternoon. Many of these uh, allied health professionals feel that they are not numerous enough in number and that the availability of the services that they offer is variable across health boards. And speech and language therapists, I think, are very much at the heart of that. Christine Graham. Well, this may be heretical, but there I've done it before, is I very much support the Conservatives in their call for more health visitors because I think if you're selective with your health visitors, you miss the point. Jackson Carlo. Thank you. I I want to just return finally to the point that Nanette Milne made, which is as we evolve the integrated healthcare model going forward, and I hasten to suggest actually the pace of change and the shape of what there will be in the future is probably way beyond even any of the imagining that we currently have, given the shifting demographic pattern of our population and the way in which healthcare services will need to reflect that. It's important that the allied health professionals do have a leadership role in determining the evolution of that model and the services that they provide, and that they are not simply thought of as something that will also be done, but they are central to all of that. I close with this point, and I don't mean this in a party political way, because I recognise there are members on other sides of the chamber who are sceptical. But if the Westminster government fulfills the promise it's made about significant extra funding for health, the consequentials that will come to this parliament could, by the end of it, be several hundred million pounds a year. It's terribly important that we don't just allow that money to be used to keep things as they are and to keep the, simple, the ship of state as it is. 
The model that we need to see evolve has to make use of the opportunity it's given to allow real development in all of these services. And I know that the Minister will be keen to see that that is so, but it will be a challenge, I think, as we go forward to ensure that we, we rise to it. Thank you. I now call Rhoda Grant. Ten minutes, Ms Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this has been a positive debate, and I think um, there is consensus across the Chamber on the importance of the role of AHPs. And I don't think that's something um, that AHPs um, aren't unused to hearing. I think they've heard that very often. But I think they expect a bit more from us about making sure that those roles are enabled to be played at their full part um, to, to provide the benefits that they very much can do. Um, I welcome the additional funding, the three million um, that the Minister announced today, and it will go um, part of the way to redress some of the cuts that we've heard about in the debate. So I think while this is welcome, there possibly needs to be more done. It would be, um, it would be helpful if she would, um, in her uh, summing up, tell us if that has come out of the integration budget, um, that additional funding, it would be useful to know. Um, presiding officer, I'm not going to list all the AHPs and the services they provide. Some members have tried to do that, um, got their tongue in a twist, so I'm not even going to go there. But also, there are just so many, I think, and that's become clear from the debate today, that if you start trying um, to list them, the chances are you're going to miss a number of them out, and they all have a very important role to play. Um, especially important in that role is cutting unscheduled admissions into hospital. Uh, keeping people out of hospital and indeed getting them out of hospital once they're in there. And I think that's really important because this isn't an add-on service. It's a crucial part of the healthcare team and something we need to do. Um, our amendment today calls for an audit of the National Development Plan. And that's something that's been called for by AHPs themselves. And this is because there's only 10 months left to run until the completion of the plan. And yet, the Scottish Government have barely reached the halfway mark with this. And in their progress report, they acknowledge that. Um, but we need to see um, how the outcomes, and indeed the outcomes that are causing the greatest challenge, are going to be met in the future. And it's especially important, given that those outcomes that are really lagging behind actually have the most to offer when tackling unscheduled admissions and indeed delayed discharge. Um, the four most significant that are falling behind are support for independent living, reconfiguration of enablement services, the shift to community-based activities, and indeed self-referral. So if we're only at 52% um, of achievement, we really need to make some progress in these final months of the plan. If I can turn to self-referral, a number of speakers talked about this. Um, it gets people back on their feet much faster but it also cuts down double handling. It saves time for GPs. Previously, people went to GPs to be referred to, for example, a physiotherapist. That was a waste of the GP's time. Now people can self-refer themselves. And I think it's extremely important that that happens because um, it, it goes not only to, towards achieving, achieving the plan, but means that people are back on their feet uh, much, much quicker. And Hans Alec, Hans Ala Malik talked about this, uh, better outcomes, faster recovery times. But he also said the system had to be improved because if we're looking to build in that speed, um, waiting for maybe three weeks um, to have a call back from a referral service means that somebody may be off their work or indeed have their condition um, worsening as they wait for that referral. A lot of people have talked about the challenges um, that we face and would, that make the role of AHPs uh, even more crucial. Um, living longer, but as Mike McKenzie said, and I would have to agree with him, living longer is actually a success. It's something we should celebrate um, and, and be very proud of because it's something that we have achieved and I think we all hope to attain. Um, but what we need to make sure is that those additional years that everyone gets are quality years. Um, people need to be active and independent, as Jane Baxter said. So I think this is an aspiration that we can help, with the help of AHPs, we can fulfil. Mike McKenzie. I wonder uh, um, if the member agrees with me also that rural health care presents particular challenges that can perhaps 
be at least partly addressed by the use of allied health professionals. And I'd be extremely pleased if she does agree with me, because that would be two issues that we're in agreement on this afternoon. Rhoda Grant. And, and that's a rare occurrence, I would have to admit. But yes, yes, I do agree with that. I think um, AHPs not only have a huge amount to offer in, in rural areas, but I think the way we de deliver AHP services, which I hope if I have ch a chance I'll come on to, using things like e-health and the like, I think would be really important. Um, a number of speakers talked about falls prevention, using exercise to strengthen frail elderly people prevents falls. And if we read from some of the briefings we've had today, 86% of unintentional injury is due to falls, and indeed 75% of hospital in admissions. And indeed, hip fractures are a great cause of mortality. So it's something we need to deal with. And I'll take this. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my apologies if it did come up. I had uh, uh, an important meeting. I was away for about half an hour. Uh, but one of the professions that I haven't heard mentioned is that of the dietitian. Uh, because, of course, good eating will preserve the quality of the bones in all the people, reduce the instance of breaks and the effect of falls. So I wonder if the member might care to agree that dietitians are an important part of this landscape as well. Rosa Grant. In, indeed, and um, my colleague Jenny Mara has just whispered into my ear that their role in delivery of meals and wheels and indeed the nutritional impact of meals and wheels would be really important. But not only dietitians, but also speech therapists and their role with working with dietitians about swallowing and making food easier for older people um, to consume. I think all that has to, to, to be uh, included. Um, and again, it shows us the variety of services provided by AHPs. A number of people in their, 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 their speeches talked about dementia. Um, Sandra White about dementia-friendly communities and indeed non-pharmacological -pharma services. And I think that's the only one I'm going to try and pronounce because all those um, um, are, are, are difficult to pronounce. But I think it's really important um, things like Christine Graham had talked about, about art and music therapy, uh, triggering me memories in people um, with, 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 with dementia. I think it's really important as well that we have people who understand maybe past art and music and the like, um, that, that, that people can relate to depending on where their memories fall. And indeed the customs and practices of the societies they, they lived in um, that actually provide reassurance to them. And uh, Michael Russell talked about the drop of number of AHPs working in those areas. And I think as we have more dementia in our communities, those roles are becoming increasingly important um, to make people feel reassured who are experiencing that condition. Um, I talked about um, the enabling and, and rehabilitation services that AHP provide, AHPs provide. Um, I think it's really important that those are provided early, both in hospital when preparing for discharge, because we know that hospitals are really disabling older people, not being able to walk around, uh, not becoming um, independent, and that can make them very, they can lose the ability to look after themselves very quickly. So um, OTs should be available in hospitals, but also available very early in discharge, and that service may be, may be intense in the initial stages of somebody's discharge to get them back on, the, on their feet. Jenny Mara talked about um, AHP representation on boards, and she, she was very clear that this was representation of AHPs as a collective, not as individuals. Um, I think this is really important because if we're really going to shift the balance of care, the boards that make the decision need to know what's available. And we have boards that have medical and nursing reps on them, but we need to make sure they also have AHP reps on them because they need to be at the very centre um, of decision making. And I think as members here have described today, that it's actually only when you start speaking to AHPs that you learn uh, the impact they can make. Thank you. Thank you uh, for taking the intervention. Um, I wonder if the member would um, not agree with uh, myself and indeed Stuart Stevenson, uh, whose uh, point earlier was that uh, the size of board could actually inflict some degree of damage due to the speed of decision making. And there's no requirement for every 
um, everyone to actually be on the board. Rhoda Grant. Um, I, I, think, I think the member misunderstands the point we're making. We're talking about one person, and, and a number of boards have already appointed an EHP rep onto their number. So it's only the boards that have ignored that role and have not included them. So one rep, not, not uh, as I say, representatives of every profession, but one rep of the EHPs collectively, I think could make a big difference to the understanding and make-up of the boards. I'm, un I'm seeing... Oh, I'm deciding officer... Can continue for a wee bit yet? <laughs> OK. <laughs> J just tell me when you need me to sit down, and I indeed I can continue. <laughs> um, because there are a number... There, in fact, there, there are a couple of really important issues that I haven't touched on yet. Hamzala Malik. Thank you very much for that, officer. I, I just wanted to uh, highlight the point that uh, was made earlier, uh, that uh, in terms of uh, people who are treating people with uh, difficulties with art and, and drama, and that how local um, volunteer groups and other local organizations are taking up that responsibility rather than the NHS. Um, isn't there a danger, if that happens, that we can actually suffer uh, the drain of expertise from the NHS itself and relying on local organizations could actually mean that in long term we will actually lose the, the, the mainstream employees uh, and the, we will not have a uniform service that we currently enjoy. One moment, Ms Grant. Whoever has their telephone on, could they switch it off immediately? Uh, Ms Grant, if you could answer that point and come to your final points, I would be grateful. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yes, I can answer that point. I think we need both. Um, we need people within the community. I um, recently visited the Highland Football Academy, where um, ex-football players were meeting people with dementia, talking to them about their experience playing the game while those people were young and indeed in a supporting role. So I think it's really important we have both. We need to tackle, uh, presiding officer, the number of physiotherapists available. A number of speakers have talked about the drop in physiotherapists and indeed senior uh, clinicians. I think we need to address that to make sure that they are there um, giving their expert advice. And things like um, people talked about incontinence, people talked about uh, stroke, people talked, indeed Cara Hilton talked about education. We need to make sure that there are enough senior clinicians in there um, to make that impact. Others talked about housing associations and indeed adaptations and the like. I think it's very clear that housing associations have a role to play, but that housing needs to be available in our communities so that people are at the centre of their communities. Too often they are tucked away in a backwater. I would have to say um, Howard Doris Centre, which my mother stays in, provides sheltered housing, but they also have the library. They also run art exhibitions. Indeed, it's, it's the pulse of the community, almost a community centre, as well as the centre for sheltered housing, and I think we can learn a lot about that. Concluding, presiding officer, um, I think, as I said in my opening, AHPs are used to getting warm words from politicians. Um, we're all quick to point out the value of their contribution in health uh, care and prevention, um, but they have to be valued as part of the health care team and held in equal esteem. And this, more than anything, would allow them to bring to bear the full impact of their skills in prevention and cure. Thank you very much, Mrs. Grant. Can I now call on the Minister to wind up the debate? Minister, till five o'clock. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, outside, at the outset of this debate, I acknowledge the importance of rehabilitation and enablement in supporting the health and social well-being of Scotland's population. And in my view, the contributions made across this chamber have supported that position and have recognised both the achievements made and the challenges that remain. Jane Baxter said that she thought the work of the allied health professionals was undervalued, and she made an excellent contribution. And I don't think the work is undervalued by people who know about what they do and in their communities. I would say it's very much underpublicized in the media, and I hope this debate has gone some way to um, recognise that and that we are able through this debate to communicate with AHPs directly, maybe through uh, their professional magazines this debate might be uh, reported um, and that 
Maybe we can all use uh, the columns that we have in our local press to uh, publicise the work that uh, we believe AHPs really do in our communities and how valuable it is to the overall health of our um, population. Um, as you've heard, the implementation of the AHP delivery plan is demonstrating significant impact, uh, for example, in our national MSK programme and our national falls prevention programme. AHPs are working co in cooperation with a range of partners, building community assets, supporting public health, reducing inequalities and enabling people to live full, active and productive lives. They also, through our unscheduled care improvement programme, contribute to the reduction of unnecessary admissions to hospital, facilitate early discharge, support people to stay at home and reduce the length of stay for those who are acutely ill or for whom admission is the most appropriate option. AHPs have shown themselves to be senior clinician decision makers alongside their medical colleagues and are working across Scotland as the first point of contact pr uh, practitioners to support prevention, early intervention and enablement. And Jenny Mara mentioned the multidisciplinary team. We must also remember that if the patient isn't in the meeting, that the patient is always at the heart of the meeting um, and that their needs are taken into account and it's um, discussed uh, with them. So for individuals and families, particularly older people and those with dementia or complex needs, AHPs play a central role in helping them to live active, self-determined lives and avoid unnecessary admissions to health or care settings. Jenny Mara. Um, I thank the Minister uh, for, for giving way. Um, given we are agreed on the efficacy and effectiveness of the multidisciplinary teams, can she tell us what plans that her government has to, to make sure that they roll these out across Scotland? I think they are at the moment a model of best practice, but they are not happening everywhere. And, and what is the government doing to, to encourage that across all GP practices? Minister? Yes, I'll, I'll come to that um, in, in my speech. Um, uh, they have in many areas taken the lead to ensuring rehabilitation pathways are integrated across, across health and social care and in doing so have developed strong links with the voluntary and independent sectors. And we've heard many excellent examples today where significant achievements have been delivered um, across Scotland where preventative spending is already being achieved and where outcomes are being improved for service users and their families. I was particularly interested in Mike Russell's reminiscence therapy, which is widely used now with people with dementia. The HP consultant in the Care Inspectorate has supported the focus on activity in care homes, uh, making every moment count. And Christine Graham uh, mentioned that too. Um, and also, the importance of the uh, physiotherapy rather than having the uh, horror of, of mesh implants was mentioned by many. Christine Graham. Thank you, Minister. Um, notwithstanding your response to Mike Russell about the drop in the number of arts therapists, I see it's down 27% uh, from 32 to 23. Could I ask the Minister to look at this and consider, given um, Mike Russell's contribution and, and, and a minor way my own, to reconsider and to look at increasing these therapists across the spectrum of needs? Minister. Uh, well, I'm not sure if uh, Christine Graham was in the chamber when I, I replied to that particular point by Mike Russell. Um, but I, as I pointed out, there are many other organisations doing that. Um, but certainly we'll take a, that away um, and, and look at it. Ms Graham, stop here, Claire. <laughs> I would like to highlight again the leading work that AHPs are undertaking in the rollout across Scotland of the centralised musculoskeletal referral management system that offers referral to the public, triage by phone, promotion of self-management and web-based resources and specialist advice or intervention from a physiotherapist or podiatrist when clinically indicated. NHS boards currently using the MSK telephone service demonstrate on average 13% of patients transferred from AHP to self-management and sustainable AHP-led pathways. 
show evidence of up to a 25% reduction in orthopaedic referrals combined with increased conversion to surgery rates and up to 30% fewer low back MRIs be, by use of consistent protocol. This chamber has already heard how practical assistance in the form of advice, equipment and adaptations can uh, enhance independent living. Using smart care in North Lanarkshire, a fast track assessment approach was piloted by local authority occupational therapists in one locality and in with three month, within three months the waiting times for assessment by an occupational therapist um, were reduced and I think this was something that um, Cara Hilton uh, mentioned um, in her speech and how um, she didn't think that NHS, Fife and NH and the council uh, were dealing properly with delayed uh, discharge and I think they could take a leaf out of the book of the OTs in North Lanarkshire who have introduced a portal for web-based self-assessment which has freed up OTs to undertake uh, further assessment for those most in need and waiting times went down from nine months to eight weeks and that's the sort of um, example I think that Jenny Mara was calling for to be uh, rolled out um, across the country. Um, Hospitals at home services are central to the delivery of the outcomes for integration and the 2020 uh, route map. Uh, an example, uh, and there are examples of, of this. Assessment, diagnosis and management of acute episode is undertaken with one hour and 86% of patients assessed are able to be treated and, um, at, at home. Um, and the average length of stay on a team is 4.4 days and less than 50% of patients are admitted to hospital and the cost of this service is between two thirds and 50% of a hospital um, stay. So the quality of care is good and it's if not better than hospital care as patients have told us and some of them say that this is the way health care should be. It's like the cavalry coming over the hill. Um, and while we see a move for, from, uh, for AHPs moving out into the community, they also work in, a, in the A&E departments and prevent uh, significant numbers of unnecessary um, admissions. So, presiding officer, I'm proud of what has been achieved in Scotland. And in fact, AHPs in Scotland are now being recognised across the UK and internationally for leading edge and innovative work they are doing to improve care, redesign services and enable active, independent and productive living. For example, discussions are underway with Australia and New Zealand regarding testing our musculoskeletal service model within their uh, health service. But as I said in my opening remarks in, to this debate, while there has been, whilst there has been significant progress made in delivery, um, there is still much more that needs to be done. And we will, strengthening, will strengthen our enabling approach to service delivery through the, the actions of our national delivery plan and the refresh that we've talked about today. And this will provide the opportunity to focus even more on rehabilitation and enablement and on other aspects of efficiency and productivity and ensure NHS Scotland is best placed to realise the 2020 vision by providing safe, is, is effective, person-centred care, supporting people to live at home and in a homely setting as long as possible. And I can reassure um, Rhoda Grant that the extra three million, uh, which I think will help drive this forward, uh, has not come from the integration fund. It's come from the Chief, ex Chief Health of Pro Profession Officers budget and also from the programme for capacity building um, in primary care, I hope she will be pleased uh, to hear. So members across the chamber have identified areas where we would seek to have further improvement and we will bear these in mind uh, when we reflect on the reflesh of our delivery plan. Um, as I said in my opening statement, um, I do agree with the, um, the uh, amendment put forward by the Liberal Democrats. And I think in Jenny Mara's amendment, um, much of what she asks for is already being um, delivered. Um, the, there is regular benchmarking with NHS boards to identify the programme 
um, of all the deliverables, and we've already published a national report on the programme to date. Um, we would seek to co-produce a refresh of the AHP national delivery plan to reflect on the areas that are requiring uh, additional support. You know, it's up to the audit committee if they want to do uh, an audit on it, and of course the audit office themselves might do that. But I think all the way along that we ourselves are, are, are looking at it and seeing what's working and, and what isn't. And in terms of the um, self-referral, that is already happening in, in some areas and is being rolled out as the plan develops. And if you could bring of, your remarks to close. And in terms of the physiotherapists, um, I think the, uh, Jenny Mara would agree that that is a board decision. I remember when I came into Parliament, there were too many physiotherapists not getting jobs. They are now getting jobs um, and they are in the system. So, a presiding officer, in the spirit of being consensual in this debate, sending out a clear message to HPs that they're doing a great job, I will accept Jenny Mara's amendment. Thank you. That concludes the debate on allied health professionals enabling active and independent living. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 1396.2 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 13196 in the name of Maureen Watt on allied health professionals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 13196.1 in the name of Jim Hume, which seeks amend motion number 13196 in the name of Maureen Watt on allied health professionals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. That amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13196 in the name of Maureen Watt as amended on allied health professionals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number one two.